You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 178 of the Common Descent Podcast, a podcast where we talk about science and evolution and paleontology and Earth history. Today, we will be talking about all of that in related to ears. I'm listening. Yeah. This is a fun one. This We've done a couple of sense-related episodes before. Yeah, we did eyes in episode 68, and we did smell in episode 130. So we are now adding hearing or ears to that and ears are crazy complex life has evolved ways to hear multiple times in multiple groups sometimes within the same major groups with different mechanical solutions to turning sound into nerve impulses yeah and that's not even the only thing that ears do no (laughs) so there's multiple jobs going on we'll be discussing what is an ear you know what are its parts what jobs are done inside the ear? What are the varieties of ears that we see? Because there's a bunch of very different kinds. And what does the evolution of these complex organs look like? This episode, as all of our episodes are, was requested. So that's why we're talking about it. And it was requested, either ears, hearing, or other associated parts of the ear, by Alejo, Taterboy, Toy, Brian, Carrie, Rebecca, Mad Jack hyphen, Jesse, John and Janice, and Kyla. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. This episode will be a, a way for the ears to learn about themselves. Yes, exactly. It's like how we are the ob- universe observing itself. Yes, exactly. This will be the ears <laughs> finally going, oh, I didn't know I was doing That's all that. That's what we were up to. Before we get into everything, some quick announcements. Our first announcement, as always, is that we have a Patreon. Still there. Mm-hmm. It funds the podcast top to bottom, and when you sign up for our Patreon, you can get access to all sorts of extra goodies, extra content from us, bonus episodes, time with us on live streams every month, and at the upper things, some extra merch. But at certain levels, you can get a shout out at the top of every episode if you're new, and our new patrons today are Philip, Ava, and Philippe. Welcome and thank you. Thank you so much for your support. We are immensely grateful to all of our patrons. We would not be able to do the podcast without our patrons, both financially and also just in terms of moral support. Mm -hmm. Uh, It helps immensely. So a huge thanks. Over the summer, we celebrated and continue to celebrate hitting 500 patrons. Yep, yep. As part of that celebration, we added two new upper tiers, which have already had people join them. You'll hear those names at the end of the podcast. And we're doing a giveaway. So if you are a patron by the end of the year, you will have a chance to win prizes, which we will be announcing in our annual live stream in January. So if you're not a patron, now is a phenomenal time uh, to join in. You could get cool goodies. Check out details about that on our website and Patreon. And if you are a patron, stay a patron, at least up until we do the drawing. Don't go anywhere. (laughs) So that you can be part of the giveaway. Once we've done the drawing, everyone can just... You're all set free. Rats on a ship. (laughs) Addy, I didn't get nothing. (laughs) No Uh, ties. subscribe to the Common Descent podcast, and uh, you might get a lousy t-shirt. Yes. (laughs) That's going to be one of the prizes. You might... That t-shirt is in the works right now yeah the art's uh, coming together and it's not going to be a lousy t-shirt it's It's, so i'm so excited i I want one i'm Mm -hmm. gonna have to become a patron yep (laughs) (laughs) we also are just now wrapping up the end of spooky season yes spooky is now behind us by the time this comes out we will have done our last thing which is after our Five spooky episodes this year Mm -hmm. we had the bonus cute e episode this year which was tons of fun And then the live stream Mm -hmm. on November 11th. So by the time you're hearing this, that live stream is over, but you should still be able to watch it on our YouTube channel. It's still on up there. It'll be on the playlist with all the other spooky videos, so you can still go take a look. And there's tons of new fan art, so check out the website to see all that awesome, all the awesome dragons that got added to the spooky verse. Such such a cool uh, selection of art this year. Tons of fun. So check all that out, and we'll see you next year with more spooky goodies. (laughs) But we are now reaching the end of the year, 
which means we are reaching, we are coming up on the end of the year Q and A. This is an annual tradition. At the end of every year, we put out a questionnaire. People can submit questions to us, and then for the very end of the year, we wait right up until the end. We will release a giant Q and A episode where we just answer as many of those as we can get through. Yes. That discussion will end up being somewhere between three hours and 15, 16 hours of yep. uh, recording. <laughs> uh, usually we come in around four, I think, these yes. days. The Q&A question submission form will go live on November 10th, which means by the time you're hearing this, it's already up. Yes. There will be a link on our website. There will, We'll be posting about it on our social media. There will be a link in the episode description. Go to the form, submit a question for the end of the year Q&A. It will be closing on December 10th. Mm -hmm. We've shifted previous years. It was the 15th. So this year we're starting and ending a little bit earlier. So if you are a person who likes to wait till the very last minute, the last minute is earlier this year yes. than it was previously. So keep an eye out for that. We look forward to your questions and to answering as many of them as we possibly can before we collapse from recording exhaustion. Yes, but as of right now, you have almost a month, so you have time to think up a question and go submit it. And with that, we are at the end of our announcements, which means we're at the beginning of our first section, which is the news. Every episode, we like to visit some of the recent science news and research that's happened in the worlds of paleontology and evolutionary biology and Earth history to keep us all up to date on what's going on and what the updated data is saying. David, what's new? Flesh-eating giant lampreys. We just finished Spooky. It is and, not and, Spooky and anymore. I'm still not only <laughs> continuing the ocean theme <laughs> that we've been unable to escape this this year, also Spooky. Uh, this is research by Fei Xiang Wu et al. in the journal Nature Communications, and we will link in the blog post where all of our news links go to an article in Science News by Carolyn Gramling. Lampreys are jawless fish. Uh, today, there are only two living lineages of jawless fish, lampreys and hagfish, both of which are weird and creepy uh, in their own right. Yeah, have mouths, can't close them like we can close ours. Yes, lamprey mouths are typically funnel-shaped with lots and lots of teeth, and they often use them to attach to a host. They'll sort of sucker themselves on to the side of a fish or something, and they're either drinking blood, they're either sucking blood, or just eating the tissue mm -hmm. that they're chomping on. Lampreys are super important for studies of vertebrate evolution because jawless fish were the first fish, so lampreys are often studied as windows into what the early evolution of fish might have looked like. But, as you might imagine, lampreys being sort of long, ribbon-like, squishy things... They do not have a very good fossil record, so there's not a ton of evidence there. Yeah. This study describes two very well-preserved lamprey fossils, uh, whole body fossils, Whoa. in the sediment from the Yenliao biota in North China. This is a fossil deposit that is also known for, like, birds and dinosaurs with feathers on them and mammals with fur, so a nice soft-bodied preservation of uh, two lampreys. These date to the middle to late Jurassic period, around 160 million years ago, and are here identified as two brand new species, Yenliaomyzon oxysor and Yenliaomyzon ingens dentis. The study describes what is interesting about these in regards to two particular features. The first is the mouth, mm -hmm. which is described uh, in these lampreys in the paper as consisting of a complex series of movable mouth parts. It is also described as, quote, extensively toothed. Oh. Lots of teeth. I'm going to be quoting specific things a bunch in this because there's some really fantastic examples. <laughs> this is interesting because the earliest fossil lampreys that we have have very small mouths and very small teeth. Yeah. These are much more complex, much more heavy-duty mouth parts that they noted are most resemble among modern lampreys, the pouched lamprey, which is a flesh eater. Okay. Is a predatory, a carnivorous lamprey. And in fact, one of these specimens, uh, they reported having skeletal remains in its guts. Whoa. That it ate something. Yeah. Like ate a fish. Uh, in fact, uh, another quote that I pulled straight out of the paper that said, quote, their dentitional pattern, so the teeth, resembles 
Geotria, that's the pouch lamprey, a large flesh eater that can even destroy the skull of teleost fish. Whoa! So these are, that's a that's a serious bite. Yeah, this is an actual teeth teeth going on. Yes. So these in a fossil, Jurassic fossil lampreys, probably carnivorous, probably not parasitic the way that we think of a lot of lampreys today. The other feature that stands out is their size. The larger of the two is 64 centimeters long. That's a little over two feet. Yeah. The way that it was described in the article is, quote, the length of a small dog. (laughs) End quote. Which, fantastic. Not as long as a horse. Not as long as a horse. But the length of a small dog. Uh, Go listen to Spooky if you didn't get that joke. You're out of the loop. This makes Yen Liao Maizan Oxazor the largest known fossil lamprey. Okay. And... Only a few modern lampreys get bigger than this. Yeah, I was about to say, like, that's that's decent. Like, I know lampreys aren't aren't itty-bitty, but they are not usually that big. Yeah, that's a two-foot lamprey. They actually did list in the paper which ones get bigger. Mm-hmm. Arctic lampreys, Pacific lampreys, and pouch lampreys, the, the same ones they were comparing them to, all get up to, they said, 75 to 85 centimeters. Wow. So not quite three feet, two and a half to three feet. Yep, yep. And sea lampreys... Uh, can apparently grow up to 120 centimeters, which is four feet long, uh, which is about half as long as a horse. <laughs> that's I, a lot of lamprey. I did not know there were lamprey that got that big. Yeah, they get, they, that's huge. That's intimidating. Yes. I, leeches are one of the few things that give me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> Giant fish leech. Yeah. At that, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> What's interesting about the size, besides just being big, is that, as they pointed out, All modern lampreys of that size share a developmental habit. Mm. Smaller lampreys are often freshwater species that stay in one place. Larger species are anadromous, which means they migrate up rivers like salmon do. Yes. As part of their reproduction. Uh, These lampreys also, the fossil ones, have distinct fins and other structures that would make them more powerful swimmers. Modern lampreys are notable for their complex multi-stage life cycle. Mm -hmm. Like they start out as, I I believe they said, little filter feeding larvae, and then they go through a parasitic stage, and then they get to an adult stage. The fact that these are big like those modern lampreys might indicate that that lifestyle had also evolved or was at least possible by this time in the Jurassic period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And indeed, they said, this was in the abstract, that the familiar modern lamprey lifestyle may not have been established until the Jurassic period with, as they put it, enhanced feeding structures that the more complex mouth parts, increased body size and quote, more penetrable host groups. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. I lo- it's, it's <laughs> awesome. I think that's my last my last quote that I'm pulling. <laughs> this paper is full of just incredible little bites. That's a good one. Uh, they also did a phylogenetic analysis to figure out where these fit. And there's not a ton of fossils to go on. So this is, you know, a work in progress. But this is some potential evidence that large-sized, flesh eating like carnivorous lampreys may be the ancestral condition for modern lampreys, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as opposed to the sort of parasitic lifestyle that we typically think of. That some of those features may be something that was established in the Jurassic, and from there we got lampreys like we know them today. Very cool. That is, first off, learned a ton about lampreys. Yeah. That's awesome. As we always like to point out, the current situation with a group does not mean that that reflects the ancestral situation. Yes. You know, the fact that the go-to example of a lamprey is a fish leech that latches on and then feeds off the fluids Mm -hmm. of a host. This sounds more like a cookie cutter shark. Exactly. Yeah. Like (laughs) that doesn't mean that's what they started doing or what was the most common form for them to be doing. Yeah. So yeah, this is a very cool find. Also just awesome fossils. Yeah, they're the, really well preserved. That's got, fantastic. Uh, uh, images of them in the paper. So, uh, if Nigel Marvin ever decides to go back <laughs> to dangerous seas in the past, one more thing to watch out for in the Jurassic: uh, bitey lampreys. Yeah, yeah, toe biter lampreys. How <laughs> penetrable are you? Watch out for these lampreys. 
That's the tagline <laughs> yeah. on the poster. <laughs> it was it's coming right at it was the it was as long as a small dog, and it was coming right at me. I don't know if the authors of the sea. intended to be. It's it's very rare that I find myself inclined to quote a paper the way that I might quote a movie. Yep. But this paper is just chock full of great lines. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. My first bit of news is also about squishy parts, but squishy parts on caterpillars. Okay. So caterpillars... Less the, spooky, less aquatic. Yes, much more uh, approachable. Caterpillars, the larva of moths and, ca- and butterflies, have six legs up front, like normal insects, six legs. But they typically also have leg structures in the back that are called prolegs that are not the same. They don't have the same grabby parts. They're kind of suction cuppy. Yeah, when you look at a caterpillar, it can be easy to imagine that they're like a centipede. Yes, where like they lots have of legs all the way down. Lots and lots of pairs of legs, but they're insects. They only have three pairs of true legs, and then they've got a bunch of leg-like things filling in that role in the back. There's been a question for quite some time of what are those structurally and developmentally? Are those le- copies of legs, or are they new structures? Mm-hmm. And this study seems to have found some evidence that might lean toward them being something new. This research is by Yuji Matsuoka et al. in Science Advances, and the article is by Richard Pilardi in Live Science. So, we just went over six legs up front on the caterpillar that are the normal insect six legs. These are insect legs. They've got the little grabbers at the end. They have the structure we'd expect. In the back, the pro legs are unjointed. They don't have jointed parts like we think of an insect leg. They have gripping hooks at the bottom that act like a suction cup to grab onto surfaces. Mm -hmm. And some can have as many as nine pairs. Wow. So very different in many regards. Insect up front, Mm -hmm. velvet worm in the back. Yeah, very much so. These are used as like anchors while they feed with those front legs to like move food to the mouth and like grab onto food. They're controlled with hydraulic pressure. So moving the liquid inside the limb, not actually any musculature to them. And then, of course, when they metamorphose into butterflies or moths, these are lost and they now just have the more typical insect body. The evolutionary origin of these prolegs has been a bit of a mystery. Previously and and typically, it has been proposed that, that they somehow relate to the thoracic legs, the legs up front, and that they were extra sets of these that disappeared in most insect groups and either persisted or reappeared, that the genetics were reawoken in this group. But others have proposed that they are something new, a novel trait, as it's often called. And then a third hypothesis is that they are modified indites, which are structures on the inside of crustaceans that face inward, that are kind of leg-like structures, and were notable in ancestral crustaceans, and therefore would have been in the genetics of the ancestors that gave rise to insects. Hmm. So some have pointed that that could be the structure that gave rise to this structure. Right, that there is a a shared structure in insects that is basically the corresponding piece to the endites and crustaceans. Exactly. They decided to test this by looking at which genes direct the growth of these appendages. They did this by altering embryos of the bush brown butterflies to try to determine which of these origins seems to have the most support. The alterations they made ha- had to do with disrupting genes that's ha- that trigger the placement of limbs and other structures on the body to try to figure out which grouping of limbs shares or do not share these genes. When the genes were partially disabled, they said that precursors of typical as well as the prolegs developed in the abdominal area, so toward the back. So early versions of the normal legs and the prolegs, but when it was fully disabled, only the precursors of the normal legs were present. So when it was turned off completely, they did not both turn off, only the prolegs turned off. And because they were both present when it was partially disabled and only one was there when it it was fully disabled, suggests that they do not develop from the same cells 
as the normal insect legs. Right. They they may they share some developmental mm-hmm. background, but it's not just another leg. Yes, they aren't coming from the same source in the germ cells and the starting cells mm-hmm. when the embryo develops. Interesting. This led them to conclude that they do seem to be more similar to modified indites, which like the ori- one of the other hypotheses that these were other legs that were lost and came back. Indites were lost in insects that evolved from crustaceans, but could have been triggered back on to form this new structure in moths and butterflies, which is not unheard of in insects. The only other area is mouth parts, Mm. which some mouth parts also seem to be repurposed indites. They said specifically the cutting edge of the mandible seems to be a highly modified indite. So Interesting. not the only time that these structures have come back up, but it seems, at least the support here, seems to lean toward these being new structures for moths and butterflies derived from these ancestral crustacean structures. They even noted that the prolegs have a lot of similarities in the, the genes that are expressed with some of the parts of the head. So there, there even seems to be some parallels there. Insect development is so cool because it feels like they're just built out of modular pieces. Well, like they're Legos. Yeah. It's like I, I could replace this part with a bunch of parts or move it around. They're they're segmented. Mm-hmm. I, that, that That is a feature of them. They are segmented organisms. And so you get all these different parts that keep getting modified and adjusted to form different types of structures. We've talked in previous episodes about the development, evolutionary origins of insect wings mm-hmm. and things like that. Also, I made a comment at the top of this news that this was significantly less spooky themed. <laughs> but the question of where different limb-like structures originate was is actually directly relevant to yes. our conversations <laughs> in this year's spooky, especially that first episode. Yep, yep. We uh, did not end up using indites. Uh, we for... did not. We did. We did reference insects. <laughs> yes, we did. We did talk about them. <laughs> yeah, no, insects are crazy. They passingly mentioned that a bunch of the mouth parts are like ancestrally were limbs. In yeah. insects, just in case you didn't know that, like, their mouth is made out of limbs. Yeah, well, like in spiders. Yes, you exactly. Know, we talked in episode 123 that the mouth part, some of the parts up front of a spider that are used to either as mouth parts or to help out with the mouth parts are limbs yep. that have been modified. Which would be like if we had ancestrally extra hands up near the head that we just then turned into our mouth. Yes. That's what insect insects, that's what <laughs> they do with evolution. Uh, we did it with gills. Yes. With our, with our breathing structure. <laughs> well, my uh, second news is actually also about insects, uh, which makes this a very insect heavy news section yeah. for our podcast. Specifically, a new fossil of an early uh, dragonfly hmm. that uh, clues us into some interesting uh, things in dragonfly evolution. This is research by Emily Swaby et al. in Historical Biology, and we will link to a, uh, I believe it's a press release, in Sci News, credited to Natalie Anderson. There is a group of insects called Odonatoptera, which is dragonflies and their extended family, Mm -hmm. which are in the fossil record since the Carboniferous. Odonata is the group of dragon and damselflies that we know of today. This the, the core group originates in the Triassic. Within that core group, one of the earliest known lineages is an extinct family called Liasophlebiidae, which are known from fossils uh, from the Jurassic in Europe, Asia, and Antarctica, which is a weird other place to put them. Nice. This is one of the earliest branches of true Odonata, dragonflies and damselflies, but exactly how they got started is not uh, very well resolved, much like the lampreys. Not a great fossil record in the beginning. There's a bunch of reported fossils from the Jurassic, but as these authors describe, only three specimens from the latest Triassic have been suggested to represent this family. Okay. Liasophlebiidae. All of them are fragmentary, not very complete, and therefore can be difficult uh, to draw conclusions from. This study describes a fourth specimen that is, as they put it, better preserved. Nice. Better preserved uh, and therefore more useful to us. This fossil comes from a deposit near Somerset in the UK. It is from the latest Ratian age of the Triassic, so right at the end of the Triassic period. 
around 202 million years ago. This specimen, now, I mentioned the other three potential members of this family from the Triassic are extremely fragmentary. This one is much better. It is a single incomplete wing. Whoa! Now, that that's not a lot. <laughs> that is still very fragmentary. However, wings are very often used in fossils to identify insects. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Particularly the, uh, the venation pattern, the pattern of veins in the wing. Yes. Hint at what is different developmentally about them the same way that we might use teeth for mammals and so on. Which makes sense because they're very complex structures. So Yeah, and they're also very important. Yes, they're exactly. They're under a lot of selective pressure to di- di- diversify and differentiate. So a single, uh, most of a uh, one wing, it, it's, that's that's pretty good. That's yeah, pretty good as these More than go. it sounds like, still probably less than you were expecting. Yes. <laughs> the wing itself is about four centimeters long and about one centimeter wide. So, you know, dragonfly size. Yeah, yeah. Based on the pattern of veins in the wing, the authors uh, identify it to the genus Lyasophlebia, the genus that this family is named after, one of five genera that are in the group. They note that it is probably a new species based on what they have, but they don't name it as a new species in this paper, in part because not only is this not a super complete specimen, but the other fossils that have been identified to this genus are also typically fragmentary and incomplete, which makes it hard to compare the identifiable features to each other. Mm -hmm. So they said, without better specimens, we're going to put it at genus, but we're not going to go farther than that and try to give it a new species name until we have sort of better data to rely on to do that. Yeah, yeah. Some of them might group together. Some of them might also be new things. Mm -hmm. Like That makes sense. The other thing that's interesting about this that I thought was really cool is the timing that they pointed out of this specimen. Being from the latest Triassic, uh, it, along with those other specimens, confirms that this family of dragonflies had shown up by the end of the Triassic. And they point out that where it came from in the geologic record stratigraphically is, as they described it, in the short interval after the maximum of the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction and before the official start of the Jurassic. Hmm. So we ta- episode 15, we talked about the end Triassic mass extinction. The peak of that extinction event happens in the very, very latest Triassic, a little bit before the official geologic identifying of the start of the Jurassic period, which suggests, as they put it, that this family of dragon, this this sort of among the earliest families of dragonflies, not only was around by the Triassic, but may have first originated and radiated and diversified in the immediate aftermath of that mass extinction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That this that mass extinction happened, reached its peak, and then as it was on the downswing, this group of insects was able to become successful. Yeah. Which is a very cool, that, that's a very specific resolution to get yes, yes. on the origin of a group of organisms. Because we talk all the time about how that happens after an, an extinction that, you know, especially mass extinctions, that you now have a whole bunch of open uh, ecological roles and, and space in the ecosystem and things will diversify into it. But getting to find one that really does seem like it syncs up right on that mm-hmm. is, is not unexpected to find something like that, but cool to have that right. dating. It's not unexpected that it happened, yes. but it is a little unexpected that we find a fossil that shows us that that happened. That seems to be one of the ones during that <laughs> process. Yeah, which is very cool. Very, very neat. Also, dragonflies, best insects. They are so cool. So cool. Just fantastic. I love them. Also, dragonflies, uh, spooky dragons. <laughs> yes, We're there still we go. On the yep, yep. We're still on the theme. <laughs> My, our last bit of news goes back to the water, All right. but has... Very little to do with dragonflies. This one is spooky in the fact that it's weird, almost body horror stuff, because it's sea stars. Okay, well, yeah, right, yep. right away. Yep. We're already a little bit unnerving. Already creepy. Uh, this is another developmental news. Looking into how did the sea stars get their body shape from an ancestor who wasn't shaped that way. Right. Yes. And we'll go in more detail. But first, this is researched by Laron. Formery et al. in Nature, and the article is by Laura Bysus in Popular Science. Sea stars 
are Enchinoderms. This is an invertebrate group that includes sea urchins and sand dollars. And one of the things that defines all of those members of the group is that they have a radial body plan that is five segments coming out from a middle. Yes, they are pentameral in their symmetry. Exactly. They don't have a left and a right side. They don't have a front and a back. They have a top and a bottom, mm -hmm. but that's basically it. Everything else is five divided yes. into those sections. Uh, some have split into more arms, but they still are, at their core, a five-sectioned organism. That makes them weird enough just to relate to as another animal to begin with. But ancestrally, they should have been derived from a bilaterally symmetrical ancestor. Right. Like us. Yes. Left and right. Because they are in a group called deuterostomes, which includes tons of animals, and most of which have a left and a right side and a head front and a body and a back end. Mm -hmm. Like we think of ourselves, like you think of a fish, most animals you think of. Yeah, all the animals we've talked about in these news yes, so far, have bilateral. A front, back, left, right, bilateral symmetry. And kind of should have evolved from an ancestor like that, and we've not been able to figure out how you got to a five symmetry <laughs> from a two symmetry. You added three. Yeah, it's I don't like, see what the problem is. It's just been like a mathematical mystery of how, how could we get from here to there, and we don't have an answer. And the question is, did you get from two to five by adding three lefts? Yes, yes. Two lefts and a right? Yep, well, yep. How many? What, what's, the, what's the setup? <laughs> This is research trying to figure out what's happening with this body plan. So the way they decided to tackle it was to look at the development, the developmental process of a sea star, specifically what kind of cells and genes are active in what parts of the body in relation to those similar developmental genes in a normal, you know, quote unquote, normal for a uh, bilateral bias. <laughs> right. Speaking, take. speaking very uh, from a very personal perspective. And gesticulating <laughs> with my left and right <laughs> hand from the same sort of genes in that body structure. Can we see those groups active in certain parts? Mm -hmm. Will that tell us how we got to this shape, or at least give us a starting block? And it's weird. So they looked at molecular mar markers between sea stars and other deuterostomes, which is tons of other different groups of animals using multiple high-tech molecular and genomic techniques. So, you know, there you go. Sure, looking at genes. And micro CT scanning to actually visualize the activity of those genes in the body. Cool. Real time, basically. The two of the ones that they used were called RNA tomography and in-situ hybridization. Just, I love when we get to moments like this where it's just getting more and more sci-fi. <laughs> like, we're scanning a body to see what the genes are doing, but... I love it. They built a three-dimensional map of their gene expression in the body. That's cool. So that they can actually see what genes are doing in different parts of the body throughout the sea star, top and bottom, across it. Now, as it develops uh, from... The baby. Through embryogenesis. Uh, yep, yep. Through its embryology. Exactly. Specifically, they were looking mostly at the genes that map the growth of the sea star's echoderm, which includes its nervous system and skin. So that's what they were focusing on this study. I'm sure there could be further studies for different tissues. And what they found was very odd. The signatures associated with head development in other deuterostomes were everywhere in ju juvenile sea stars, just all throughout them. Hmm. The expression of genes for torso and tail sections, so, you know, the back portions of the body, were basically missing. Hmm. So they had tons of head genes going on, no body genes happening. And they said effectively, the entire echinoderm body is just a head as far as deuterostome gene expression is concerned. So, sea stars are just that one sequence from the thing. Yes. <laughs> it's a head with legs on it. Yep. And they're not even real legs. Yep. They're just parts of head. Uh, it's just more face. <laughs> <laughs> and if you cut that face in half, it'll make two faces. Right. Yeah. That'll go and slowly digest other things. Well, and if you do that too much, they start jumping onto other people's mm -hmm. faces and taking over, and then they spread throughout the cosmos. It, as soon as they get one big eye going... They get a big eye in the middle. We're in trouble. Uh, DC Comics. <laughs> so they noted that that does give us at least the start of an idea that losing the trunk section may have been a key step in going into this five-section body. Yeah. That there's definitely something happened very notably that lost the... Genes for 
those other body segments and only retain the head. What exactly that was, we still don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, what, what drove that yeah. change? Or exactly how that change happened, but there does seem to be a connection, or a very likely one, for the loss of the rest of the Durostone body plan, retaining the head and allowing them to live and feed in a new way. You know, thinking about a sea star, this actually makes way more sense mm -hmm. than I would like it to. No. Yep. Because, yeah, the, the mouth is just right there in the middle of the underside of a yep. sea star. So it's just, yeah, it's it's just a head facing downward. Yep, yep. With pseudopods coming out the sides of it. Yeah. Hmm. All right, now do cephalopods. <laughs> now tell yes. me what now tell me what cephalopods are up to. <laughs> I love it. That's what a what a so this news has been <laughs> all for a li first of all, spooky, fantastic. Yes. Also, just four newses about fascinating uh, groups of animals that we really should do episodes about. Yep. So send in your requests now for episodes about uh, whatever we just talked about. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we can wrap up the news and get ready for our first section to discuss what's an ear and what does it do? Yeah, while we're talking about heads, <laughs> you stick staying in the head region. <laughs> Well, I'll talk about ears. Uh, ironically which, enough, sea stars, no ears. No ears. as it turned. Also, uh, ears in the head, another very vertebrate-focused uh, uh, thing to say. Yes, yes, that yes. It's a very vertebrate kind of thing to say. That was. As you'll as you'll see later. <laughs> Our bias is showing. We're going to get a lot of angry emails from uh, crabs and spiders <laughs> yes. who are like, you're really, this the, the accessibility of your podcast rating uh, way down here. Yeah, no. it's uh, Everything else you're doing great. That, come on. Do also, sea stars, not... Th this, they're not listening to the podcast. <laughs> Stay tuned. We've talked about a couple of other senses thus far here on the podcast. That's true. We did a smell episode. Mm -hmm. That was episode 130. And we did an eyes episode, uh, yes. episode 68. Those both were very complicated because sensing the environment is very complicated. Ears and hearing is no different. It is arguably, though, the most mechanically complicated. It has many literally moving parts mm -hmm. that the others do not have and is extremely diverse in the different ways animals have come about to hear their environment. Not just as in diverse off of a form, many different approaches to doing it, which is also different from a lot of the other senses. Hearing is kind has come up multiple times in different groups on its own, or at least many parts of it have come up on their own. So hearing it has a lot of different shapes to the way organisms hear, but on us, we have our ears, one on each side of the head, and they are very complex structures. They reach deep into your skull and are housed within one of the densest bones, the temporal bone. Mm -hmm. And the ear is not just the flap on the outside. There's a whole bunch going on inside, which we're familiar with. We've all had ear wax and <laughs> sure. so forth. You've heard of the inner ear. Yes. And, and we've talked about inner ear stuff on the podcast a bunch. Yes, we do. Because it is not just for hearing. There's also the entire balance system wrapped up in there. Yep. So there's a lot going on in a very small space in the skull for the ear. Yeah, I feel like as sensory organs go, ears kind of get overshadowed yes. alongside eyes. Mm -hmm. As eyes get all the attention for being complex and dramatic, which they are. Right? Eyes, we did all, we did an eyes episode. Very complex structures. Also, certainly very important structures yeah, for yeah. us and a lot of other organisms. Yeah, we rely on it very heavily. Yes. So, it makes sense that eyes get a lot of attention, but right behind them and a little to the side, mm -hmm. our ears are extremely complex structures. They have the auditory system, which is, you know, what we think of when you think of ears is for hearing. This is the part that lets you process sound. But the vestibular system is also part of the inner ear. It is housed right next to everything that does the hearing. And it's the part that gives us the balance. This is the semicircular canals that let your head tell which way it's moving and what its position is right this is the thing that if you spin around a bunch 
uh, this is what gets thrown off that yes. makes you feel dizzy. Exactly. So that is also a very unusual thing about ears. Those are two very different things to be sensing. Yeah, those like, are two different departments that yeah. happen to have offices across the hall from each other. Because they're using <laughs> the same tools to do the sensing. Mm -hmm. But balance and sound are not actually related really at all. <laughs> And that is one of the kind of unique things. I saw it listed that nowhere else in the human body are two equally distinct jobs so closely housed together yeah. in the anatomy. Like the inner ear is doing two critical jobs right there on top of each other. So it is very, very multi-part in the structures doing this. So let's take a walk through just the human ear, like a basic walk. We'll go more detail into all of these parts as we go through. But really quick, just so that we have our general sections, the outer section, the external ear flap, is called the pinna. This is the flap of the ear that mammals have. Right. This is our satellite dish yes. that is capturing sounds. It helps determine direction and direct sound into the ear. Ours are fairly inactive compared to a lot of other mammals that have very mobile ears. Right. We don't, our ear, for, most of us can't move our ears much. Yes. So that is the outside part. Often, though, when you hear the outer ear discussed, it's talking about the ear canal. Mm -hmm. That is the outer ear that goes from the outside of your skull into your skull and ends at the ear drum. Right. The ear canal is the part where the Q-tip goes, or uh, according to some people, shouldn't go. Yes, according to the box, <laughs> should not go. Uh, and for anyone who's taking advice from us, you read the box. <laughs> Please do not treat anything that we ever say on this podcast as medical advice. Nothing we mention in this podcast are we suggesting you should ever put in your ear. <laughs> the eardrum, or the tympanic membrane, or the tympanum is sometimes what you'll just hear them called, is a thin layer of skin. It is basically a continuation of the skin of the ear canal. Ours is flattened and a bit cone-shaped and points in further into the skull. So it's kind of... It's concave. It's concave mm -hmm. inward and is edged by a ring of bone. This is the tympanic... Sometimes you'll just hear it called the tympanic bone. The tympanic annulus is another word for it, but it is supported on all... Like a drum head. Yes. It is supported by a solid ring to keep it taut. Yes. That's why we call it an eardrum. Eardrum. Looks like a drum. Ours has three layers. The outer layer, which is that skin. An inner layer, which is mucous membrane from the middle ear. And then between the two, there are fibers, which gives it its tension and stiffness. Mm. So it is really like a drum made out of animal hide where there are fibers giving it that tension and that strength. It is full of blood vessels, which is why it hurts so much if something happens to your eardrum. Yeah, careful with those Q-tips. Yep. Or if you get like an infection, it's why yep. it can be so painful because your eardrum is incredibly sensitive because you need to know if that gets yes. hurt. Much like an eye. <laughs> yes. Like, yeah, if there's damage there, that's priority one. This is the thing that catches the sound, so to speak, where air vibrates with sound. It hits the eardrum, it vibrates, and it sends it to the middle ear through the three ossicles, the three little bones of the middle ear, the malus, the incus, and the stapes, or the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, yes. respectively. You'll, you all remember that from biology class. Yep. These transmit the movement to the inner ear, from the eardrum to the inner ear, where the actual hearing happens. Mm -hmm. So all up until now, we've just been transporting sound. Yes, now, carrying the signal. Mm -hmm. Much like to relate it again to the eyes... All of the structures within the eyes whose job is to collect light and gather it and deliver it in a form that can then be received by the optic nerve, which then brings it to the brain. The ear has a whole bunch of parts whose job is to take movement of air and convert it into something that our brain will eventually be able to understand. Yes, it converts it into mechanical signals of the vibrations of the eardrum and bones and then reaches the inner ear which has a number of parts. The inner ear is made up of the semicircular canals, which are these big loops full of liquid that detect movement of the head. Mm -hmm. It's what lets us keep our balance. It also is what lets you direct your eyes in the right directions because it is keeping track of the positioning of your head. Yes, this is one of those when you hear, uh, as we've often discussed on the podcast, the 
simplified way that we sometimes teach things when we're learning about things for the first time. We brought this up in the herbivores episode about herbivore, omnivore, carnivore, and then you go into it and you go, it's way more than that. When we talk about the five senses, yes, and there's a list of other senses that aren't in those five elementary school senses, sense of balance and direction is one of those that gets sort of overlooked that you can tell most of the time if you're right side up, what direction you're looking, things like that. Yes, yes. Uh, You'll often hear it called the sense of equilibrium, Mm -hmm. that it's what lets us keep everything in position and, and upright the way we want it to be. Housed near that is a curled snail shell shaped structure called the cochlea, at least in us humans and some other animals. We will mm-hmm. get to other names for this structure and other yes. organisms. We're very human centric so yes. far. Right now, just the ears that you have closest to you is what we're talking about. This is the part that actually does the hearing. It will take those vibrations and hairs inside the cochlea transmit the vibrations into nervous signals. Mm-hmm. And then from there, it goes to the auditory nerve and to your brain. And now you have heard whatever you heard. There's something really satisfying about describing how hearing works on a podcast. Yes, right? This is what's (laughs) happening right now. This is happening. (laughs) Every syllable we say is happening. All all of these steps, it's having to go through for you to make sense of them. We made sounds and then it was gathered and translated by a microphone, which then transmitted it to a computer, which is now transmitting it and translating it into your headphones or speakers or whatever back into sound waves, Mm -hmm. which are then being translated and transmitted through your ears. There's a lot of cool technology and biology at work to get my word to your ear. Yeah. So whenever we say really just ridiculously dumb and silly stuff, all of that's going into that to be able to hear our silly jokes. A lot of work went into delivering that Mm -hmm. joke. Well, millions of years of evolution <laughs> so that we could make some <laughs> dumb joke and you could enjoy it driving to work or whatever. Yep. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about sound just to put that in sure, reference sure. in case anyone doesn't. Physics. Yeah. Just the physics of what sound is. Sound is the vibrations of a medium caused by whatever is the source of the sound. Mm-hmm. So sound waves are just vibrations Through whatever the sound is traveling through, that could be air, water, Mm -hmm. can travel through earth. Each of those will have a different speed at which it's traveling, which is the speed of sound for that medium. Yes, in those conditions. Yes. The speed of sound is not a constant like the speed of light. Mm -hmm. It is determinant upon what the sound is traveling through and what the conditions of that thing are. Right. The temperature of the air, uh, the thinness or thickness of the air, the speed of sound is different at sea level versus elsewhere, different in winter versus summer and so on. Precisely. And we typically classify them into low to high frequency with hertz being the measurement of frequency, Mm -hmm. low frequency being 20 to 200 hertz typically, with below that being infrasounds, which we humans can't perceive. Yes, under sound. Under below sound. Below what we can hear. Which we named because we can't hear it. Yes. Tons of other things can hear it, which they would just call really low sound. Absolutely. Well, it's the same as like infrared. Yes. And ultraviolet. Mm-hmm. It is so low or so high that nothing could possibly hear or see this as long as it's a human being. Yep. High frequencies, we'll typically be talking 5K to 20K. And then higher than that, we call ultrasound. Mm -hmm. The sound's volume we measure in decibels. And so this is how loud it is. Yes, exactly. And hearing typically is just defined as the ability of an organism to detect and react to sound. Mm -hmm. Because technically, everything is affected by sound because you are vibrated when sound hits you, whether you can tell or not. But the ability to detect those vibrations and then do something about it is the the typical definition of hearing. Determining if an animal hears something can actually be quite difficult. Yep. You know, you can't ask, how does this sound to you? You know, check, check, give me a thumbs up if you can hear it. You have to try to determine, did they react to the sound? Or even if they don't react, did they still hear it? Right. And then not react to it. Yeah. And, uh, and as I'm sure we'll get into, is there a barrier between hearing and feeling? Yes. Because we're talking about waves moving exactly. through a medium. So it, it can be difficult to parse those things out. Yeah, there is not a clear cut line. When it comes to us detecting sound, there are a couple of important tasks to do. Hearing sounds great, but one of the things we do with sound all the time, even though we 
typically don't think about it is localizing it, mm -hmm. telling where it's coming from. Yes. And there's usually a couple of main ways to do that. And the two main ones, these are often called binaural locus cues in that there are ways for our brain to determine the location of sound. The two main ones is a difference in time. That mm -hmm. sound hits one ear before it hits the other. And we can say, well, you know, our brain can say, because it's better at math than we are. Right. Based on the calculation of how long it took it to reach ear A, then ear B, it should be this direction. Yep. These are often called time cues. And then intensity cues are the other where mm -hmm. when it hits the first ear, it's stronger. And then as it makes its way to the other ear, it's a little bit weaker. Yes. The and, kinds of fascinating distinctions that we are able to mm -hmm. make without actually thinking about yes. it. Yes. Where you can hear a sound and look toward the direction. And if I asked you, how did you do that? You'd go, well, it sounded like it came from yeah, that it way. Sounded, it yeah. sounded left. These calculations are what's happening. This also comes in with the balance system that is going to allow you to direct your eyes you know, mm. effectively. So that is there is some connection there. Our external ears are important for those jobs as well as just more efficiently capturing sound. And they can also have secondary jobs they can do. Like a lot of animals use them for communication. You know, the positioning of their ears. Our cats and dogs, we're all familiar. You know what a sad dog looks like <laughs> because... Yeah, it's a it's a message it's sending. It's another part of body language they can use is the positioning of the ear. Yeah, that, that mobility of the ear is also something that a lot of animals will use to help gather yes you know i if you look at a dog or a cat when a noise happens they will sometimes turn their mm -hmm. ear in that direction i love doing that with a, a cat with like my cats when i used to have them to while they weren't looking at me say something and watch the ear move yes while they paid no attention Seem to me visually seemingly paid no attention yep. you're like i can tell you heard me yep that mobility animals can also use to change their facial expression yes and then one of the other fun ones is for is thermoregulation to help control heat. Yeah, because it's a big old appendage, mm -hmm. which are really good at gathering or releasing heat as needed. So you have lots of animals where it has been noted that they will either increase or decrease blood flow to the ear. If it's warm outside, you increase blood flow to get rid of heat from the body. And if it's cold outside, you decrease blood flow so that you can retain heat. Right. This is very famously the case in animals, especially animals with big ears. Yep. Rabbits, elephants, things like that. Mammal. This is very much a mammal thing yes. to do. Yeah. Once again, those external ears are pretty much among mammals. Most yeah. other animals do not have outside structures for the ear. Yes. Another one that I'll point out here, one of my favorite secondary uses of a mobile external ear is fly swatting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's animals will point. use it to shoo bugs away. They'll mm -hmm. just flap their ear. Uh, you can see this in action if you have a cat or a dog. Cats especially. Yes. Um, if you gently poke a cat in the ear, it'll swat you away. With <laughs> it'll <tear>. Stop that. <laughs> <laughs> so very complex structures doing tons of jobs. These, almost all of these parts of the ear are even more complicated and diverse as you go into other groups. Mm -hmm. This overall structure is often called the labyrinth, the inner ear labyrinth. Just because it is very labyrinthine, there's tons of passageways, there's tons of openings. Yes, and also famously, a tiny little minotaur mm -hmm. at the center of each one. Yep, 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 yep. If you ever thought you heard something, but you didn't... That's the minotaur. That's the minotaur. It's in there, it's <laughs> rearranging stuff. <laughs> all vertebrates have two labyrinths. So all of us bony animals have two of these structures, one on either side of the head... And it is broken up into main sections. So we had the outer, inner, and uh, middle and inner ear. Mm -hmm. The labyrinth is also broken up into major sections. The superior division, which houses the vestibular system and a couple of other things, has those semicircular canals. These are fluid-filled tubes that go up in arches, each at a right angle from the other, to get your Y, X, and Z axis of movement. You'll often hear these called the horizontal, the superior or anterior, and the posterior canals. Each of these end in something called a crista, which is a kind of like a valve, a little widened area with sensory cells. And these are what's doing the sensing of the movement. This, the sensors are not along the canal, but at, at the ends. You also have a structure connected to them. This is where they open up to called the utricle. This contains some structures that we'll be talking about later for sure called macular endings. 
These are plates with ciliated cells, so hair cells, each which has an otolith, which is a little calcareous mass, just like kind of like not quite bone, but bony mass. And this is the kind of the anchor for those hairs so that they can shake and detect mechanical you know, uh, uh, input. These are often called the gravity receptors. These are what gives us our sense of uprightness and can detect sudden movements and so forth. So these hairs attached to the otoliths, those otoliths act as the air brake, basically, but inside gel to move the hairs. There's also a structure inside the utricle called the paplia neglecta, which has some sensory hairs for hearing purposes. So this is part of the hearing job. But most of that stuff is happening in the inferior division of the labyrinth. There are some similar structures. There are more of those macular endings, the macula, as they're often called here, in a structure called the saccule, which is a small sac, as the name suggests. This is the structure that, in some groups, is fairly simple, and it's just a, a long, short to long straight sac, but in others becomes curved, and this is what in us is the cochlea. Mm -hmm. So this takes on many, many shapes and it is extremely characteristic depending on which group you're looking at. This is the main hearing structure. Inside of it, there is a membrane, the basilar mem membrane, which runs along the inside of the cochlea and has the organ of corti, which is where all the hair cells are for that hearing. So this is what's doing most of the hearing inside the labyrinth of the ear is the basilar membrane with its organ of corti. These two major sections of the labyrinth show differing amounts of diversity. The superior division with those semicircular canals is pretty constant. That does not, it does have changes, and we will talk about some of the adaptations there, but those are fairly consistent across vertebrates, minus things like hagfish, which has reduced the number mm. of canals they have. But among the rest of the vertebrates, they kind of look generally like the same structure, they are recognizable. Yeah. Across basically all vertebrates. That fish got it right mm -hmm. way early on, and then it's just kind of stayed that way. Well, because being able to detect motion and gravity hasn't really changed right. across the amount to which you need to detect it and what sure. you're doing with that. Exactly how you're moving mm -hmm. and all that will change. But overall, that structure stays pretty stable. As opposed to hearing. Which is crazy diverse <laughs> some which don't even resemble each other because that's going to vary based on what kinds of sounds you have to listen to what environment you're trying to hear the sounds in the frequency the 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 volume all that stuff the medium you're listening in all sorts of th sound itself varies quite a bit yes and very often who you got your hearing from mm -hmm. because a lot of groups have come to very different conclusions on how to achieve usable hearing. So let's take a quick look through some of the variations of ears we find in animals. Starting with the first vertebrate ears, which would be fish. Fish. Fish do indeed have ears. They can indeed hear. They do not have external openings because they aren't taking in air vibrations and they don't have, you know, any external flaps because of that. So there's nothing to direct into an opening. Right. They don't have a canal. Nope. There's no hole for the ear. And they have Differing levels of hearing ability. Some have dedicated ear structures for hearing sound. Others are mostly just detecting it with other structures. Sharks and rays, for instance, have the labyrinth with the canals and their maculae back there for gravity detection, but no auditory papilla. So they do not have a hearing structure. They detect it probably by the vibrations of those macular organs and their lateral lines, which are their vibration detections for water, also are going to let them hear sounds that make it into the water. Mm -hmm. Many bony fish, though, have dedicated ears that work, though, very differently from our own. Instead of having an eardrum to catch sound, they have internal ears and just detect it through the vibrations that enter their body. Right. The as, vibration in the bones and the tissue and yeah. such. As sound moves through the water, it hits the fish and moves through the fish. Yes. And the fish uses repurposed macular structures that have lost their gravity detection and seem to be used for sound detection now. Okay. And those little masses, which here are different structures, but are still called otoliths. 
but are, are typically made out of something slightly different, I think, than mm. a lot of other, you know, than the mammalian otoliths, at least. This acts as a, what we, they call an inertia ear, where the otolith sits there, and then as the body vibrates, it vibrates slower because it's got more mass. Yeah. That sends the signal. This is not a particularly effective form of hearing. It's not very sure. efficient. Not, not very specific, not very high resolution, yep. as it were. Not a lot of frequency bandwidth. You're not mm. hearing a wide variety of sounds. They're mostly good at hearing lower frequencies, but some can get better, especially some that have extra adaptations to increase the resolution of the signal by adding a gas chamber next to the ear to capture the vibrations a little more effectively. Some of these have created just unique gas chambers. Others use the gas bladder. That is the fish's floating organ. Uh, yeah, you're, you're double doubling up on that structure. Yep, and have kind of used that as a internal eardrum-esque thing to capture those vibrations more acutely. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Catfish are one that I saw noted for this a number of times that connect the swim bladder to an area next to the labyrinth to capture these sounds. And some of them will even have a chain of three to four small bones, the Weberian ossicles, that extends to the line to the wall of the swim bladder. Yeah. So this is an important thing to put into context for fish. Most of those specific things that Will described of uh, the parts of our ear are not there in yes, fish. Yes, they don't they, have... They, they don't have the flaps on the mm-hmm. outside. They don't also don't have those three inner ear bones yes. that we talked about. That's a mammal trait. That's a mammal thing. That is a thing we see in mammals. So it's really interesting to hear that catfish, for example, have developed their own series of little individual bones that are doing a very similar thing. Yes, we see a lot of convergent and similar adaptations for hearing even if it's in a wild like this doesn't have an eardrum it has the swim bladder right this is a completely different structure but they're still working off of the same mechanical properties amphibians show a weird diversity of ears some amphibians have very little ear to speak of They've got the labyrinth with the equilibrium going on and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. But as far as hearing specialization, many of them do not have much. And then frogs have great ears. I was going to say, I can guess which ones are the ones that have good hearing. Yep. From most of what I could find, it seems that all the major groups of amphibians do have ears. Mm -hmm. But just some have adapted them much further and others have even potentially regressed them. Frogs have a tympanic ear, so they have an eardrum-esque structure, different from ours, but still the same concept. But Sicilians and salamanders do not have eardrums. Right. They don't have a tympanum. And already we are starting to see a intuitive correlation here. That Sicilians and salamanders generally are not very noisy animals. Yes. They're not using sound to communicate with each other, whereas frogs are among the most famously noisy animals. Absolutely, because hearing is important not just for you to hear your environment or to hear out for predators or to listen out for predators, but to hear other individuals yes. and communicate with one another. There are earless frogs, just to put it out there. Sure, and I believe it. Many of those still have good hearing, but they use body the walls of their body or mouth or lungs to transfer sound to the inner ear. It's such a cool concept that... Once again, to make the comparison with eyes, detecting light is something that is a very specialized sort of thing for a cell to do. This is also, t- to a certain extent, the, the, the same thing with smell or yes, taste yes. or something. But sound is vibrations. Yeah. And in theory, every part of your body can detect vibrations. Yeah, exactly. Like, that is something that's going to happen to you regardless. Yes. So it, it makes sense so, that there are multiple ways to... Yeah, you detect it. Different animals can use different parts of the body to contribute to this detection, which is pretty cool. Absolutely. So the, the frog ear is more complicated on the inside than the outside. They don't have an outer ear. Mm-hmm. The eardrum is flush with the head. So that little circle you see on the side of their head behind the eye is their eardrum. Yep. And then behind that, they have a rod of cartilage and bo- bone called the, the columella, which is acts as their transference, like our three bones, but it's just one here, uh, made out of multiple parts, but still one rod that t- goes from the eardrum to the inner ear. There is a expansion at the base, which is often called the stapes. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. And is a separate developmental structure, but is fused with this rod, so it's not moving separately. And this is what transfers the sound to the fluids of the inner ear in the otic capsule, which is where the sound gets transferred in other ears as well. Reptiles often have a very similar setup, so they often will have no real, or at least not much of an external ear. Right. Sometimes there is a hole. Like yeah. Lizards very commonly will have a hole yes. in the side of the head. And the ear canal is very short if there is one. So there might be a hole and then a short channel. Some do have ears basically flush with the head. Mm -hmm. And then some have no visible external ear at all. Snakes and turtles are famous for this, not being able to see the ear. But they are set up in a similar way where they have the outside eardrum. They have a tympanum, a bone, the columella again, but sometimes they just call it the stapes, referring to that widened in. And then that takes it down to the inner ear where they process their sounds. It also will have a cartilaginous extension called the extra columella. So sometimes it will have kind of a second part, but not another bone. Right. So another, uh, continuing variations on this small bone or rigid structure that is there to carry sound from the eardrum yes. through the inner ear. Their eardrum bulges outward instead of inward like ours. So it is a slight, it is a different structure to it, but same basic concept in its functioning. Where the variation is most notable is in the auditory papilla with those hair cells. They vary extremely across groups in the number of hair cells inside. Uh, chameleons, they said, have like 40 to 50. A lot of other li lizards, like most other lizards, will have like 60 to 200. And geckos can have up to 1,600 which is the largest known of any saurian, and they have notably more acute hearing. Yeah, they, which, again, mm -hmm. these are vocal lizards. Yes, these indeed. These are lizards that make noise. So you can often find some parallel with the type of ear and the behavior of the organism. Snakes have not a lot going on. <laughs> hearing, snakes have a lot of strong suits. Hearing is not one of them. Yeah, they have a lot of the structures, but uh, many of them have been repurposed or repositioned mm -hmm. they no longer have an external opening for the ear so the ear is just not visible from the outside and, at all and that's something that as you you've been hinting at lizards tend to have that so this yeah. is something that snakes lost yes. in their evolution exactly so they do not have an opening we also see no evidence of a eardrum-esque organ instead they seem to use a thin plate of bone from the quadrate bone as their vibration mechanism. Mm. So they're using a vibration detector, but it is bone now. They still have the columella structure, but now it is attached to the inner surface of that quadrate bone. And so they have some, they do still have ears. Right, they can still hear. Yes, but they have lost a lot of the adaptations that are specialized for hearing airborne sounds. Right. So they can still hear, usually at lower frequencies, their sensitivity is usually to vibrations through the body from the ground. Right. And they're picking that up through the jaw into the ear in a much more direct way. This is sometimes called somatic hearing, which is hearing through the body. Mm -hmm. There's others that you'll hear called that. Sometimes I saw fish referred to as somatic sure. hearing. Which is interesting because it's not surprising to me that with all of the ridiculous restructuring of the skull that snakes have done over their evolution that they had to make changes to the ear. Yes. And it also lines up quite well with the fact that snakes tend not to be particularly noisy animals. Mm -hmm. And the snakes that do famously make noise are not making it for themselves. Yes, they're not, that's not it for, for other snakes. snakes. <laughs> no, that's for you. Mm -hmm. That's for something else to go away. Now, whether or not they are silent animals historically, and that is what allowed them to lose mm -hmm. their hearing ability from their ancestors... Or whether they have to be silent animals yes. because they don't hear very well for that kind of thing uh, is a fascinating question I don't have answers to. Yep. the Some of these features are also noted in other burrowing and, you know, very, very ground-dwelling lizards. Yep. That right. will lose a lot of those ear features since they're spending most of their time underground where vibrations are through the ground are more important than what's happening in the air. Yeah. The reduction of hearing ability and reduction of visual ability have both been used as uh, evidence to support the idea that snakes may have started out as burrowing uh, their ancestors. Precisely. Turtles are kind of their own weird situation. As they always are. Yep. 
They also do not have external ears. There ha it has been debated in the past as to whether or not they could hear, since sometimes they seem unresponsive to sound. Sure. Uh, well, snakes but, but, had a similar situation where right. you'd yell at a snake, they wouldn't respond, and you're like, yep, they can't hear. And right. then we looked closer and went, okay, you can, just not most of the sounds I make, mm -hmm. or at least not very well. Right. Are you deaf or are just uninterested? Exactly. And turtles have had that where it's been unclear what degree of hearing they have. We do have evidence that they seem to be able to pick up low frequency waves. This time, though, with a plate of cartilage on the side of the head that seems to be serving as that tympanic membrane. And then all of these contradicted by crocodilians, mm -hmm. which have quite advanced ears, you know, advanced in that complex ears. Right. Compared to a lot of other reptiles. Which I would have guessed. Yep. Because crocs, again, very noisy animals. Exactly. They are quite noisy. They have external ears. Not much of an ear flap, so to speak, but there is a notable opening to the ear on the outside. Yep. It is muscular, so they can close it while they dive. So that's part of the reason it's there. A crocodilian is capable of both receiving and defending against a wet willy. Yes, exactly. They have a short tube that leads down into that tympanic membrane. Their middle ear has a special passageway that connects the right and left ear. Huh. There is an air passage that moves between the two ears. In a lot of reptiles, they have passages, but they move into the mouth cavity, the buccal cavity. Oh. And we'll talk a bit more about these uh, a little bit later, but these are important for how they determine the intensity of sounds from one ear to the other allowing sound to pass between the ears. Yeah, so the, the right ear can hear sounds from the left ear. Exactly. That's cool. And that's one of the ways they detect which direction it's coming from by that tube dampening the sound as it moves to the right ear. They also have cochlea that get called cochlea in this case because they are a bit curved and have a notable number of sensory cells. These have up to 11,000, so much more intense hearing organs. And in many ways, unsurprisingly, very similar to birds. Yep. 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 That's always where we're headed when yep. we get to crocs. Bird ears and croc ears are very, very similar. They both have that connector passageway. They both have a more curved and ciliated cochlea structure. Birds have incredibly good sense of hearing, often much higher than our own. Mm -hmm. So like they have a very effective ears. Still no external structure. It's usually just... Uh, an opening on the side of the head, hidden by feathers. That's why they need such good hearing, is to, yes, to yeah. hear the sounds through all that, that feathery covering. Because they've got all that muffling. <laughs> they also have a, a muscular opening, some call, sometimes called the metis, that can partially or fully close the ear. Mm -hmm. uh, which I'm not sure if that's on all birds, or if they're just the ones who need it. But yeah. they also have a similar structure going on. Their membrane also bulges outward like reptiles. So they have... A lot of similarity with crocs, but still are more similar to a general reptile ear Right. overall. Both the croc and bird have the single oscular chain with the columna and the extra columna uh, bone and cartilage. But we do see some more specialization of the outside of the ear. With some birds, at least, there are some birds of prey that have a flap in front of their ears, which evidently helps them detect whether sound is coming from above or below. Hmm. Helps direct the sound. Owls are famous for their asymmetrical ears, with one usually being higher or lo and lower than the other, to help add that distance and differentiate the distance and direction of sound. But it is often considered that your fanciest ears come in mammals. Yep. That, that mammal mammalia is when we see ears get really, really overpowered and complex yep. teeth ears parental care That's, yep this is these are our claims to fame <laughs> this is what we here. do <laughs> mammals have a very very clear distinction between the inner middle and outer ear we have our pinna our external ears our big flappy ears that is a mammal structure we have our inward bulging eardrum our three bone malus incus and stapes O oscular chain with the the malleus being connected to the eardrum and then that connects to the incus which goes to the stapes which connects to the cochlea we also have some muscles that connect to some of those bones the stapes and so forth which help to dampen them from their movement when we detect extremely loud sounds oh interesting yeah to so protect we have a built-in uh, uh dampener i yeah. guess is the best word 
Oh, that's very interesting. And it's a reflexive musculature that when we hear a very loud sound, it will happen usually in both ears that tenses and dampens the sound to avoid damage. Uh, similar muscles, and there's also like tendons in some others have been noted in like geckos and other animals that have a simpler dampening mechanism. Interesting. Yeah, it's one of the interesting things about sound that is not true of all senses, mm -hmm. that if you get too much of it, it's dangerous. Yes, absolutely. And in sound, it is a physical thing that can physically damage. Yeah, you're being bombarded by vibrations. Yes. And it can be too much. The cochlea is by far the most extreme in mammals. It is often slightly curved in other organisms. In us, it is a coiled snail shell shape that turns two and a half times in the coil, which is way... Like, I don't think any of the other animals that I saw or heard mentioned even make one rotation. Mm -hmm. it, only in mammals do we make full loops. And this is thought to be a way to extend that passage with more and more hair cells keeping it compact. Because the longer the passage, the higher range of frequencies can be detected. Right. This this uh, seems feels similar to when we talked about smell. Mm -hmm. That in some ways, smell work. The more space you have, the more smell sensors you can have. Yep. The better your sense of smell can be. Well, it's like big eyes let in more light. You know, yes. These things are dealing with physical limitations and aspects. So sometimes just more ear is more ear, mm -hmm. and it lets you do more. We do see some extreme adaptations in mammal ears when they are in different situations, particularly marine mammals, which have now the need to hear in air and water, some of which have you know done some simple modifications. Like a lot of seals and sea lions have very little to no external pinna. You know, their, their ear opening is almost smooth with the surface of the body. They've adjusted their hearing to be able to hear in water, but still have retained their you know, ability to hear in the air pretty much perfectly well. Whales have weird ears. I believe it. They have converted pretty much entirely to an aquatic form of hearing. They have no pinna. They have no external ear structure. The external opening has been reduced to a minute size, as I saw it in one pinhole in some species. Mm -hmm. Like, barely effective for any air to move. Right. Barely any canal, mm -hmm. as we typically think of it no longer serves as the entrance to sound. So this is just vestigial opening that's still there. Doesn't seem to be doing any of the jobs it was. Maybe there's a new job it's doing that I'm not aware of, but mm -hmm. it's not hearing anymore. Their eardrum also seems to serve no more useful purpose. Interesting. They still have one, but it's not doing anything. It's connected to the malleus just by a ligament. And in studies where that ligament was cut, didn't affect their hearing ability. So once again, seems to be a vestigial remnant of the ear. Still has all three of the bones, but the stapes is now way bigger. Interesting. And seems to be potentially acting like those otolith masses in fish. It now is the thing that causes the inertial vibrations when the water, the sound travels through the water into the whale, vibrates that stapes, and then lets them hear. So they still have... So they, they, they've kind of secondarily converted that very distinctive mammal hearing system into something more like what we see in fish. Yes. In some ways, to work in the water again. Yep, yep. And it's able to vibrate because it's in a gas pocket inside the ear. Interesting. So they now have a very different ear from most mammals. And if you thought that was as weird as it would get, we haven't even talked about invertebrates. Yeah. <laughs> Bug ears are so weird. <laughs> Bug ears. This is a thing that came up with eyes. Again, mm -hmm. episode 68, that invertebrates, arthropods, uh, yes. very famously. And typically insects is the focus yes, of it. Yes, because of course it is. Yep. This is yet another example of a sensory structure where we've got this very distinctive thing in vertebrates, and then there are arthropods, insects, and friends that went us too and yep. did their own whole thing with it and they did it over and over and over again we see hearing across a ton of groups the crickets grasshoppers katie did's group yeah very noisy insects very noisy your cicadas obviously. extremely noisy <laughs> <laughs> even more noisy a lot of your true bugs some moths have it and even some flies at least mosquitoes okay mosquitoes have a form of hearing hmm. to hear their prey yep most are paired organs 
So still what yep. left and right, left and right like us, but just not on the same part of the body in all groups. Yeah, this the ears are not going to be where you think the ears are going to be. Nope. In katydids and crickets, they're typically found on the first walking legs. Yep. They put their ears up front like we did, but th- they can now shake hands with them. On the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Grasshopper, though, have them on the first segment of the abdomen, which is the rear section of the insect. Right. So it's on the body wall, effectively. Mm-hmm. Cicadas also have it on the first sec- section of the ag- abdomen and have notably elaborate ear structures because of how noisy they are. Mm-hmm. And again, that noise is to communicate with each other. Mm-hmm. So they need to be able to make and receive those noises. Exactly. The only uh, true bug I found noted was the water boatman. They also have their ears on a first segment, but it's of the thorax. Okay, so they're just putting ears all over the place. Literally all over. Well, and it's not terribly surprising when we think back to our fish and amphibians that you you can kind of pick whatever part of the body you want. Yeah. To sense vibrations. Yeah, there's there's no innate reason the ears had to be on the side of our head. Yeah. But that's where our labyrinth started, and we will get into that. Mm-hmm. So that's where our ears ended up. Insects did not have that starting point. Right. So our, they can put it wherever. Our ears, like our eyes and our noses, are also con- uh, located very conveniently close to our brains. Yes. Which are getting the signal, which again, not quite the same setup <laughs> in insects to have to worry about. Uh, episode 121. Yep. For brains. Moths will often have it either on the thorax or on a segment of the abdomen. And then mosquitoes here with their antenna. Really? Yep. Huh. They have antenna with sensors at the base that when they point it toward a sound, they get the strongest sensation, vibrates the antenna, which is picked up by sensors at the base. These sensors are called scolophores, which are Sensors found all over the insect body. Mm-hmm. These are found on most of the joints of the limbs and are used for detecting the motion so that they know what position their body's in based on the right. position of the joints. So, sort of similar to what we were talking about before with our body has ways to detect the position our body is in. Mm-hmm. It's why you're able to do that test that the doctor will have you do where they say, close your eyes and put your index fingers together. Yep. You are able to sense what you're doing with your body. Yes. These sensors have been repurposed in a number of these groups as the vibration sensors for their hearing organs. Uh, It's very cool that we started off by pointing out that the ears, ears do two very different things with equilibrium positioning sense and hearing sense. And as we've gone through these various different ways that things hear, we are seeing the connection there. They're both using hair cells to detect those vibrations. Yes. And we'll talk more about that next after the break. (laughs) The other ways that insect, because that's not only are they on different parts of the body, different structures are used in different insects to hear. Yeah. The mosquitoes use their antenna, which is most perceptive to the humming vibration of a female mosquito. Oh, interesting. And is the hearing is most notable on the males. Oh, so that's it is cool. Very specifically for finding a mate. So when I joked and said mosquitoes were using their hearing to find their prey, yeah. at jokingly referring to us. Yes. Uh, that's a, that's the thing that the females do. So yep. I was even wronger than my joke uh, would have initially been. They actually are using it to find each other. Many of them will use just the hairs on the outside of their body, which also will have that nerve supply at the bottom and just vibrate when the air vibrates. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of these will have them at the ends of the abdomen, those tufts that you'll see. Some of those are hearing structures and very often can be pointed at things. These are often called, though that version is often called Circle organs, uh, C-E-R-C-A-L, not right. <laughs> circular, but circle. Yep. And you'll find these on like cockroaches and some crickets that have hair-like structures off the end of their abdomen yep. that can be used like a dowsing rod. It's stronger <laughs> when it's pointed in the direction of the source of sound, and they can pick up those vibrations. You stick to point your butt in the direction of the sound. Yep. You've, but... heard, you've heard of butt breathing. <laughs> this, is, this is butt hearing. Butt hearing. Many, though, have tympanal organs, Mm -hmm. eardrums. Now, their eardrums are just thinned out sections of the exoskeleton that can vibrate. It's not skin, because that's not what they're working with. And have a group of those scolophores positioned at areas around it to detect the vibration of it. These are the kind we see on a lot of your katydids on their arms, the cicada on their body. Moths also have versions of these. And kind of like we were talking with the lizards, the number of scolophores 
syncs up with the intensity of sound and hearing. Yep. Grasshoppers can have 80 to 100 scolophores associated with their eardrums. Cicadas can have 1,500. Whew. So they have a ton. They're the mammals of insects. Yep. Obnoxious. There is some evidence of hearing in spiders as well. Oh, interesting. Uh, it might just be that they're sensing with their hairs on the outside because mm-hmm. they can sense airflow movement that way. But in their bodies, there are these slit openings called liriform organs. And they can sense, they are definitely sensory in nature. They, they definitely are sensing. Many think that they're probably kinesthetic, so detecting motion and movement, but they could be used for hearing potentially based off of their structure. One type in particular that seems to be different and is on the metatarsal, so the next to last segment of each leg near the joint, and has a number of slits that go around the leg, usually about 10, they said in a common house spider. And each slit has a fluid chamber with a thin filament running through it from one side of the wall to a cell, a sensory cell. And that compression of that structure stimulates the filament and seems like it might be playing a role in sound. So they might have ears on toward the ends of their legs, but it's not quite sure that that is what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those situations where it's hard to tell always whether or not an organism is hearing the way we would define hearing. Right. Where do we draw the line between hearing and shaking? Yeah, feeling sound and hearing sound. Yes. Are there, is there a difference? Where is that difference? Which one are you doing? Right. And and at the end of the day, does it matter yes. a whole lot? Right. We're, once again, we've made a box mm-hmm. and we're trying to put things in it. And it could be that this animal can react to sound even if it doesn't have specialized structures. So it right. might not have ears. And if it doesn't have ears, that the thing it can't hear. Right. And or also, or are you still just hearing with your body? Right. And if you're very small, mm-hmm. you know, you're picking up vibrations in the air. So you may, your whole body could be an ear. Absolutely. In that sense. Yes. I'd imagine it's very similar for a lot of marine invertebrates where it's like you mentioned with the sharks, mm-hmm. which I thought was an interesting note. They have a lateral line system. The for job, sensing vibrations. For sensing movement in the water. Animals that live in the water are often going to have something like that. And that is doing a big portion of the job that ears would be doing. Well, it's at that point, now are you just splitting hairs on vib- types of vibration? You know, right. When I move in the water, I create vibrations. When I make sound in the water, I create vibrations. Right. They're different, but if you can pick them both up, how different are they actually? And finally, speaking of things that it's hard to tell whether or not they can hear, there is a ton of evidence that plants can detect sound. Mm-hmm. We've talked about this a little bit before. This came up mostly in uh, the plant spooky. when oh, We sure, talked about yeah. talking trees and stuff that plants can produce sound, not just that they make noises when like wind rushes by them or something, but that in specific scenarios, they will produce specific sounds and other plants seem to react to those sounds. To what degree that is hearing and how they are all, you know, Able to do that is not consistently confirmed or agreed Mm -hmm. upon. There are definitely some patterns that seem to be real similar. Plants can seem to respond to the sound of caterpillars chewing and trigger appropriate defenses. It's been noted that they can seem to respond to pollinators approaching flowers, seemingly using the flower as the sound receptor. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So like there's definitely trends. Many of them make sound when they photosynthesize and we can detect changes when they are exposed to certain frequencies this has been noted in some algae as well with seaweed and others increasing cell growth during certain sound waves so there's definitely an interaction happening but where it falls on the venn diagram of what we define as hearing is much harder to pin down yeah because it's as often we struggle to define what plant behavior means as animals yes every now and then we see we watch a plant do a thing and we go wait it's i didn't know you i didn't know you could do that yeah i didn't i didn't know that you could did stuff yeah i didn't (laughs) i didn't expect to relate to the plant experience yeah well and again it makes perfect sense much like how most organisms outside of animals can't see Mm -hmm. but they can respond to light yes exactly Most organisms outside of animals don't seem to be able to hear, but they can respond to vibration and sound, which makes perfect sense uh, in both cases because light is everywhere. Yes. And 
movement of the air vibrations right. through the air. And our universe is vibrating. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not at all surprising that things can react to them even in ways that are not the specialized way that we come to think about it. Precisely. So a plant might, couldn't enjoy a movie. Yes. But it can still react to some of mm-hmm. those stimuli. But light and sound are both factors for it. Mm-hmm. There is way more detail on all of these. Like, I found huge documents going into the diversity of reptile ears yep. and the diversity of mammal ears. But we're going to pause there. Now that we've had a short introduction. Yep, just brief. Nice and quick. <laughs> <laughs> we will take a break, and afterward we will talk about how did ears evolve, starting with how did we get the ability to detect sound just as cells. Ears have evolved many times, which is not too unexpected when we look at other sensing structures on the body and other similar complex features. That happens very regularly that many groups of life find solutions, even very similar solutions, to the same problems that basically all life is having to deal with. Right. And being able to hear is very useful. Yes. So there is not a singular origin for ears as a structure. In animals as a group, there is estimated to be at least 19 individual instances of evolution in insects alone. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) And they got them everywhere. They got them everywhere. On, On the body, on the legs. So... There is no singular er ear Mm -hmm. that things started from. But there does seem, at least based on the evidence, that it is likely the mechanisms used to sense sound does have a common ancestral origin. Okay. The hair cells that so many of the ears we've talked about up till now that use to sense the vibrations of sound have a common ancestral origin that ciliated cell likely goes back to pre-vertebrate invertebrate groups back to our common ancestor we find ciliated cells hair cells so to speak in tons of microscopic organisms yeah these are very common structures they can be used for movement but also feeding to filter you know move water and fluids into the mouth but also filter out the food and are used for reception Yes. For sensing and, their environment. And this is way outside of even just animals. Yes, exactly. Like, like paramecia, like mm-hmm. microbes will have these things. Tons of single and multicellular organisms have these ciliated cells. And they're important sensory structures. Mm-hmm. So it is very likely that that is the common ancestral origin for the hair cells and the ciliated cells we use and many invertebrates use for hearing. This would mean that the ancestral structures would go back to very early life. Yeah, cells. Yeah, cells when the earth was populated by things that were only single cells. Yeah, bacteria. <laughs> mm-hmm. Current estimates have that eukaryotes, which is the group that includes a number of single and multicelled organisms, but also animals. Yeah, animals, plants, fungi, and friends. Yep. Likely came about somewhere around like not quite two billion years ago, and that at some point they started producing cilia, which was basically just a protruded section of their cell wall, their cell membrane. Cells already have ways of sensing their environment and interacting with it with proteins on the surface that can connect with and react to chemicals and other proteins in whatever environment they're in. These cilia also have those protein sensors along them, but now give a different, you know, function to that section of the cell and therefore likely led to our hearing hairs, you know, that sense sound vibration, but also the hairs associated with balance and equilibrium. Mm -hmm. These motion and mechano receptors that they often, they're receiving mechanical information, physical vibrations and physical, you know, velocities and and accelerations. Yeah. Not different from what our hair hairs do. Yes. Like the hairs on your arm or the hairs on, uh, on the external parts of your body that can sense the wind Mm -hmm. or that can sense something near you or something crawling on you that sensory feature of a mechanical structure that you can tell when something's disturbing it exactly that that kind of sensation likely goes back to a single-celled origin Mm -hmm. 
and is shared between us and invertebrates. But that's about where the similarities end. From there, groups started doing their own things and got real crazy with it. As far as us vertebrates go, the earliest evidence we have of internalized mechanoreceptors goes back to the Devonian. There is an armored fish, an ostracoderm, called Prototerapsis micra, that had, in its skull, two labyrinths. Aha! Very similar to the labyrinths we have in our skulls now, these seem to be very, you know, simpler, not quite as complex, but still recognizable balance and acceleration detection organs. So these are their version of semicircular canals, potentially direct comparison to the ancestral form of ours that we have in our head. These were likely only good for low frequency, so not fast movements, not high detailed reception. But once you start moving around, you need to be able to take note of how your body's moving. So some form of that sense is important in an organism. So it makes sense that it goes back to some of the earliest armored fish organisms had these labyrinths already. So this is going back to just over 400 million years ago. With insects, uh, we mentioned the fact that the scolophores, those sensing cells, are found all over the body and likely predated ears for sensing their own movement and position. Right. They have the hairs all over the body. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you see similar things in like spiders and stuff. It sounds like ripe opportunity to then specialize some of them to do something different. Yes, and the scolophores are often found at the knee, you know, the joints of the limbs. To it's like how you have accelerometers in certain things to tell <laughs> what position your phone is in. Those sensing cells tell it how bent is my knee right now. Right, that's what it is sensing, but it is sensing mechanical information. These are found in the ears of many insects, likely. This was a very easy transition for them to make and why we find it in so many parts of the body because they're all over the body. So Mm -hmm. they could have pulled from these sensing structures very easily from different areas. Very likely it happened shortly after they made it onto land, you know, like almost 500 million years ago when it became important for detecting airborne sounds. But the earliest evidence we have that supports that they'd be hearing is actually evidence of them producing sound from a Permian insect called Permostrigilus, which is about 260 million years old, and had specialized grooves on the wings, on the veins of the wings, that seem like stridulation organs, which is the thing used by crickets and many insects to create their sound. Yeah, it's a mechanical Mm. way of... It's like a washboard. Yes. Rubbing part of their body against another part of their body to create very specific sounds. Now, I do not believe that this one had evidence of ears. Like preserved in the fossil. But if you're making noise, if you're making noise, it's strong evidence that you had a way to hear it or you would have, or it is very likely at least that that would have come about shortly after Mm -hmm. they started making noise. And tympanal ears, you know, eardrummed style ears in the forelegs have been found in Triassic and Jurassic catydids. Uh, We talked about them in one of the newses where they found a very early structure for them making sound and were able to actually kind of put together a database of sound making and ear structures in Katie did's to track the evolution and found that it actually coincides with the diversification of mammals, likely meaning that them being able to make and hear sounds was also responding to us hearing their sounds. Right. What I was about to point out, another nice benefit (laughs) of hearing is that you can hear not only things that you want to not be near, but you can also hear things that you want to go find. Yes. So now it seems like our hearing and Katie did hearing uh, uh, evolved alongside (laughs) each other in response to one another. Uh, It makes me think of uh, bats and moths. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There are similar stories of bat and moth specializations kind of responding to each other in terms of making noises and detecting those noises. One to eat the other and the other to avoid them. Yep, yep. But to go back to us vertebrates, since, you know, ultimately we are the ones making the podcast. Sure. Uh, Those those Katie Dids can make their own podcast. Yep, yep. I'm sure it would sound lovely. (laughs) There is a ton of research into vertebrate ears as we come onto land and start to develop the ears we know just because it's the ears we're using and a ton of crazy adaptations happen. The next big step in ear evolution, which sounds weird, and I'm sure many have already heard about this, but is the development of a jaw. Yep. We got the equilibrium system first before we had jaws, and then 
fish god jaws, the placoderms, the earliest jaw, the armored fish, had those mobile hinge jaws. That became important for the next steps of development of the ear because some of those jaw bones are what become those middle ear bones that help convey sound to the inner ear. Yeah, in the first section, uh, you had listed a number of different organisms that have developed their own take on inner ear bones Mm -hmm. that help carry those vibrations. And some lineages, notably our own, jaw bones are a very important part of the development of what we came to use as those inner ear bones. And in many others, like the quadrate bone in snakes Mm -hmm. is related to the jaw. Like the jaw became a very important structure for transmitting sound in different ways in different groups but the presence of a jaw was kind of the next big step in ear evolution before ears had even come about yet (laughs) yeah which is a which is a really cool link Mm -hmm. but also it makes total sense that's where the ear is yeah it's right there already in the right spot so the question has been asked what kind of ear did the earliest tetrapods you know coming on to land animals start with and therefore all of us you know amniotes what did we receive to as the starting point for the various ears we talked about in the first section it is thought that it is very likely hearing evolved very soon after we came into air like insects so sometime in the carboniferous period the first vertebrate ears likely showed up in semi-aquatic tetrapods and we do have some evidence in them that gives indications they had hearing ability but not specialized ears as we would call them yet They aren't thought to have had any sort of tympanum eardrum structure. They would have had, you know, those balance organs, organs, and those, like with fish using them, uh, the similar gravity detectors as sound detectors, still would have let you detect certain frequencies, low frequencies of vibration. And they said likely would have been sufficient for detecting like footfalls, vibrations in the ground. Mm -hmm. Or stuff moving in the water nearby. Mm -hmm. And that... If they were detecting ground vibrations, they could have been transmitted either through the lower jaw when it was on the ground or through the leg. So transmitted through the body. So the structures for detecting movement and balance could have been used to detect certain sounds, but not yet have a sound detecting organ. Yeah. They've noted that modern amphibians, we see, you know, that varying degree of ear, but that, that's not actually very helpful for looking at the evolution of early amnio ears because modern amphibians are very different from the early ancestors to tetrapods we call those amphibians very often but those are not the same group it's they are very different organisms what we have today is a very specific lineage of amphibians so we don't really likely have a or we don't know for sure that we have a member that represents that ancestral state right they may have been like salamanders Mm -hmm. but they also might have been doing their own thing yeah salamanders might have gotten there separately from them so we don't know for sure how those first ears were working there has been some uh, effort to try to look at the ancestry to certain parts of the vertebrate you know the amniote ear uh, the basilar papilla the part with all the hair cells that is a big part of hearing in us it has been debated whether this is a vertebrate trait you know something that showed up in those early tetrapods or has evolved multiple times because it is present in varying degrees especially once again in amphibians so like that structure in an amphibian ear may or may not be homologous you know the same kind of structure as what we have in our ear and this is further complicated by that there's not a lot of evidence in the genetics or outside groups there was a little bit maybe evidence in the fact that coelacanth embryos which is one of the remaining groups of lobe-finned fish, which would have been the group that gave rise, not coelacanths, but lobe-finned fish, gave rise to tetrapods, had hair cells suspended in a membrane similar in position to where the papilla would end up in other vertebrates. But lungfish don't have that. Hmm. And lungfish, at least according to our understanding now, should be closer related to what our ancestors would have been. Right. So they may have lost that ancestral trait, yep. or coelacanths may have just developed something similar to what we... Yeah, it, it can be difficult to tell how many times did this thing originate. So there's a lot of you know debate as to exactly how the different parts of the ears came to be, how many times did they come up in vertebrates? Yep. You know, is the inner ear a singular structure that has diversified or has have multiple groups 
repurposed hair cells for hearing. Right, because we know that, as we talked about in the earlier section, that there are some parts of the ear that have shown up multiple times. Yep. That there are effectively eardrums Mm -hmm. present in both a bunch of different vertebrates and insects. Yes. That some parts of the ear can, are not terribly difficult to originate more than once. And even in vertebrates, the eardrum is thought to have had multiple organs. Mm-hmm. That that doesn't surprise me. That layer of thin skin, which is not a complex structure when you just say it that way, a thin layer of skin is very easy to evolve. I've covered in it. Yep. That seems to have evolved multiple times based on both fossil evidence, but also, also the morphology of those tympanums and the, the middle ear structure with those ossicles. That structure together has likely evolved at least uh, five times <laughs> from different tetrapod groups. The breakdown I found that suggests at least three that I found was in lepetosaurs and archosaurs, so, so lizards, snakes, crocs, and birds. Yeah, reptiles. Reptiles likely had their single origin for their very similar shared ear. Yeah, that, that, those inner ear, those little inner ear bones. Yeah, yep, yeah, where it's an eardrum and then... Basically one structure with a bit of cartilage, Mm -hmm. the columna and extra columna acting as the rod that transmits sound to the inner ear, being separate from the amphibian, the frog inner ear particularly, since most other amphibians don't have a very complex inner ear, that frogs likely did it on their own, and then mammals are another origin themselves. This has been debated different ways. Originally, it was thought that the reptilian ear with the one bone was the ancestral state and then we added two bones to it right that mammals built upon that structure mm-hmm. it seems like nowadays it is leaning that ant- mammals are a separate origin of that structure right they, they, they are different solutions to the same problem but yes. not actually using the same bones they did not start from the same starting place and no. even if they are using some of the same structures or pieces of the same structures it's not because they both started with the same ear it's not because they started with that reptile ear, so to speak. Yes. Yeah, this is this is reminiscent of the discussion we had in episode 121 about brains. Mm-hmm. That common idea of the reptile brain... Is what we built upon. And then mammals just added mammal bits to yep, it. souped it up. Which, uh, just to reiterate, not really how the brain evolution mm-hmm. works. Similar structure here. It's very easy to assume and go, yeah, mammals started out with a reptile ear and then made it better yep. by adding a bunch of parts. That that is often not actually, the, the, the evolution of these structures is not actually as smooth as that. So it is likely that there are, you know, there is some comparison going on. The stapes is likely the same stapes that is talked about with reptiles, but that's only the expanded end of the columna. So it's not the whole bone, but a portion of it is likely the same bit of, or at least developmentally the same bit of bone. And this is thought because they both are mainly derived from the second pharyngeal arch, which are the gill arches that turned into our jaws. Mm. They both are developed from the same portion of the arch, but the malus and incus are first arch derived. So there's no part of the columna that comes from that arch. So, So those are unique to mammals. One of the reasons, or at least one study that supported the separate origins to mammal and reptile ears not being mammal uh, reptile first then upgraded to mammal is that when looking at bird and mammal auditory nuclei they found that they came from different embryonic tissues uh, so developmentally they're just different body parts exactly. essentially the way we at least specifically the parts that allow us to determine sound location came from different areas mm. so it's not likely we started with a reptile ear and then somehow use two different tissues to evolve the rest of the ear. Right. It is likely that even though the stapes does seem to carry over, it started on its own in both reptile and mammal lineages. Right. That there would have been a shared structure in the earliest amniotes, but then reptiles and mammals did different things with their ears to develop their own particular structure. Exactly. And there is some evidence for that. There is some fossil evidence for Early, early amniotes, so some of the earliest, you know, uh, 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 egg layers is, you know, non-froggy egg layers that have a robust stapes that came from the hyomandibular, so part of the jawbones, and may have acted kind of like that, those fish bones in the whale ears, where it is just 
a big bone to vibrate and pick up some vibrations. It's not doing the from an eardrum to the inner ear job yet, but it is seeming like it could be there to pick up simple sounds, but at this point is still playing a role in stabilizing the jaw while biting. And that as the jaw continued to develop and more connections were made, it could be relieved of that structural job and step into the hearing job. So it likely was the first hearing bone, mm -hmm. but just not set up in the exact same way in both groups. And so from there, we got the single ossicle ears of reptiles and birds. And then in mammals, it got a bit more complex with our three bone system. But hearing in mammals also just got complex in general. As we talked about, that's kind of one of our things. And it has been looked at quite a bit what all would have went into and would have caused the evolution of a mammal ear. Often relating to those three bones as to both why and how did we transition these bones into the ear, because these three bones were jaw bones before they were ear bones. Parts of the jaw joint specifically that over time transitioned into being both jaw bones and hearing bones, so dual purpose, and then eventually just hearing bones. Particularly the malus, malleus and incus came from two bones called the articular and the quadrate bones. Well, the stapes, like we said, is that stapy. That one transitioned away from the jaw beforehand. And this transition also happened multiple times in mammals. There are multiple times where mammals turn some of these jaw bones into ear bones in different groups. As far as it, it seems like now, at least three times. One being the multi-tuberculates which is an extinct group of mammals, kind of rodent-esque. We've talked about them before. They had very unique blade-shaped teeth and kind of a rodent sort of mouth going on. We do have middle, um, middle ear bones preserved in at least a couple of specimens. They took the surangular jawbone and made it part of the malleus in the middle ear. To put the jawbone discussion into context, because we're going to keep talking about it. Oh, yeah. If you look at mammals, one of the things that's unique about mammals is that our lower jaw is a single paired bone. Mm -hmm. It is the dentary bone. So it's just one bone on the left, one bone on the right, as opposed to the typical condition in other vertebrates, particularly in reptiles, where it is usually five or six different bones. Yes. The dentary, the angular, the surangular, the quadrate, all these different bones that you're talking about. Over the course of mammal evolution, all those extra bones in the back of the jaw diminished and dwindled which is why our lower jaw is so rigid and mm -hmm. it we can't have a jointed lower jaw the way that like snakes and lizards can and as those jaw bones dwindled they were freed up to be repurposed in some of these ways yes indeed in therians us and marsupials we have those three bones that we've been talking about monotremes also have a similar setup with those three bones but they are slightly different in exactly how they articulate and are grouped together. So it has been questioned whether or not from our ancestor to monotremes and therian mammals, whether there were two originations to the, to the two ears we have now as well. Mm, so monotremes, uh, episode 166, platypuses mm -hmm. and echidnas, may have inherited a slightly different configuration of ear bones yes. versus the rest of us living mammals. And basically the argument is, and we talked about this in the monotremes episode, so mm -hmm. we discussed it further there. Many have thought that the monotreme ear, which has a overlapped incus and malleus, where they are connected in a different way, and that's overlapping is the way it's often described. The mm -hmm. joint overlaps while we have separated just jointed uh, between those two bones. It is often been suggested that the monotreme condition is the ancestral condition and that then marsupials and placental mammals derived the ears we have off of that. Right. But there's fossil evidence that does seem like maybe monotremes have ancestral ears, but others have pointed out that developmentally it could make sense that there is a third situation, a, what they call the partial overlapping joint, could have evolved from that probably makes more evolutionary sense from at least Occam's razor of the simplest number of steps to get to the two. Yeah. So this sounds like a similar situation to what we were describing with reptiles versus mammals. It was presumed that monotremes represent the starting condition mm -hmm. and that the rest of us just changed it from there. But once again, this may be a, a case where those two different groups did two different things. Yes. But as I mentioned in the monotremes episode, 
when I was looking at that, I found paper upon paper responding to each other. Yeah. This this is very <laughs> much not a settled debate. It is ongoing as to what the state of monotreme ears is, and therefore how many times the a version of the mammal ear has evolved in mammals. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yep. That that the mammal ear isn't the mammal yes. ear. It is a few different versions. Exactly. Now, one of the big questions that comes up with the mammal ear is how did we shift from jawbone to ear bone mm -hmm. and why? Like, what would drive you to turn part of your mouth into part of your ear? How did it happen? How could you physically actually take a bone doing a very different job of structural joint to hearing, you know, transmitting sound? And there's been a number of thoughts that go into this. One is that it is likely they were already doing some of that sound transmitting if they were hearing sound through their jaw to begin with. Right. Which, as we've discussed, a bunch of other animals do. Yep. Putting your jaw on the ground and picking up vibrations. It's that uh, activity you might have done as a kid where, like, if you put a piece of string in your mouth and twang it, you know, hold it with your teeth and twang it, you can hear it differently because it's going through your skull to the ear, mm -hmm. which is a get different way of sound getting to the ear versus if you just hold it taut and twang it. It is thought that, as you mentioned with those early amniotes, those uh, some of those early tetrapods coming out, that they likely had ears able to hear sound that way very well, that somatic hearing through the body. So if it was already doing that job, there may not have been as much a distinction as it initially seems. Many have pointed that we see in mammals a miniaturization of the jaw getting smaller mm -hmm. as mammals went through a phase where they were very small for a time. And a smaller jaw has less force on the joints, which maybe weakens the requirements of those bones to be as structural as they were in a heavier dutier jaw yeah. and also if early mammals in particular were eating easier things yes yeah if, if we're imagining that they may have been insect eaters or something you may have required less strength or mobility to those jaw bones others have also pointed out that it may not have been initially an adaptation for hearing but a different kind of chewing that hmm. We may have adjusted the jaw for chewing, which happened to free up the, some of those bones a bit more than they were beforehand. Yeah. This has been pointed out with the multi-tuberculates who did their own version of an ear very separate from ours. They also had a unique back and forth chewing that was front and back instead of the side to side like we see in most chewing mammals today. There is a possibility that chewing was an important feature somehow. That it may, we may be focused on the fear, hearing too much, basically. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Another paper I found, though, suggested a different utility to adding those bones to the middle ear in that it increases the amount of what they called evolvability, which is basically saying that by adding more bones to the inner ear and increasing the genetic variation of the bodily structures in that area, it made it more adaptable. And so that... As that process was happening, it may have made the ear better at adapting and evolving to new situations and new attributes, and that this increased evolvability might have been a factor in why we see such extreme ear evolution with those three bones particularly. That it, it made a wider variety of materials available to be altered and adjusted yes. what they called like, more opened up the possibilities more evolution knobs for natural selection to turn yes is one way they said and that yeah a reptile or bird ear is fairly simple by comparison there's one element that they can mess with which gives them less to mess with while we have three that can each change on their own slightly and that might have given an edge and been a pressure to push that process further and further to the mammal ear we have now one of the big benefits to that, once we got that ear, is the high-frequency hearing we mentioned earlier being such a feature of mammal ears. It is not the only adaptation that uh, applies to that. Our coiled cochlea is important. We have fossil evidence of the beginnings of curled cochlea in some early mammals, roughly 200 million years old. So like, we can see that this process, we can somewhat track this process and see it starting. This is also a characteristic feature of our external ears, our pinna helping to direct sound and adjust the frequency of sound we're able to hear by moving the ear. And there are a number of obvious benefits to high-frequency hearing. Detecting prey, insect eating is often a, a, assumed and associated with many early mammals, and insects are small organisms that make higher-pitched sounds. If we 
are making noises to communicate. If we can make higher pitched noises, we might be outside the hearing range of low frequency hearing predators. So we need to be able to hear each other, Mm -hmm. both of which could push either higher and higher frequency. And as has often been suggested for mammals, nocturnal behavior is a big pressure for better hearing because you now lost a lot of your sight and you can if you can hear better you can move around at night better and it has been suggested that a nocturnal phase at least has been a major part of mammal evolution yeah another one that i would throw in there that i don't know if it's in your notes somewhere Mm -hmm. uh you mentioned insects being small animals that make higher pitch noises so do babies yes and another hallmark of mammal evolution is parental care and Social behavior, specifically parents and offspring. Precisely. So it wouldn't surprise me if that is also a source of high frequency sounds that may have been beneficial for mammals early on. Absolutely. So all of these are good reasons for us to have evolved high frequency hearing. But there is one other that I hadn't heard of before taking my notes. And it is another thing that is unique about mammal ears. We alluded to this in the first section, but we didn't focus on it. Reptile ears of bird and Croc ears have a tube that connects them left and right. Right. And other reptiles have a tube that connects each ear to the mouth cavity. Right. We don't have our ears connected. That's true. Which makes our ears weird compared to most other vertebrates. Yes. No matter what uh, your parent may have teased you about (laughs) when you were younger, you can't actually stick something into one ear and take it out the other ear. Nope. That was sleight of hand. Yes. <laughs> so sorry. We're giving away a dad trick. So sorry to all the dads out there. That that Q-tip did not go all the way through. No, because we have <laughs> isolated ears, which is a unique mammal ear feature, hmm. at least among vertebrates. And that's weird because that connection to the mouth cavity or to either ear is really critical for those other groups to localize sound. Right. To figure out what direction it's coming from. By using when it hits my left ear. It's at one intensity, and then as it ta- travels through that tube, it acts as a dampener so that it's at a different intensity at the right ear, and now I can calculate how far away and in what direction that sound is. We've lost that ability, or we didn't develop it. Somewhere along the line, our ears became isolated from one another. So it has been questioned, how did we overcome that loss of, 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 localiz- of sound localization ability, and It could be that to overcome that, we developed a lot of the other mammal aspects of hearing. Having pinna to better direct sound and better localize the sound to the ear canal. Right. To not only collect it Mm -hmm. like a satellite dish, but also, as we mentioned in many animals, being able to actually move the ear, the external ear, to help catch the sound. Absolutely. Having higher frequency and more distinction of frequency uh, a hearing also makes us more sensitive to the difference of intensity from one ear to the other without that connection oh yeah because i guess you can you can now just hear a wider range of sound yes kind of like uh like color vision Mm -hmm. the more of the spectrum of the light spectrum that you can detect the better resolution the more information you're able to gather so now even though we don't have that connector when it hits left ear it will still hit the right ear when it moves around our head Mm -hmm. but we won't have that convenient passage to give us the intensity difference now we are just better at hearing the difference yeah so so improved range of hearing ability has all sorts of benefits to it and this feature of the mammal ear this being isolated could be one of the early drivers of a lot of these features to say if you want to hear as well as the birds are hearing you need to get better ears to be able to keep up because you don't got a tube yeah that's interesting this is supported by things that smaller mammals tend to have higher frequency hearing which smaller animals often tend to make higher frequency noises Mm -hmm. but the smaller your skull is the less distance between your ears true the harder it is to tell the difference between timing of sound from one ear to the other or intensity So you need even more resolution. And so finding that pattern in size of skull to ear also seems to support that higher frequency is really important for being able to use hearing to locate sounds. They did also give one potential explanation for why we might have lost that passageway, and it could have to do with our breathing. We, as mammals, are continuous breathers. We breathe pretty much nonstop. We can hold our breath, but we don't just stop breathing we just breathe if we had those buccal passages that connect to the mouth 
breathing noise might interrupt our hearing ability. Reptiles who have that buccal passage are intermittent breathers. They breathe and then stop breathing and breathe and stop breathing. So they could be able to hear effectively while not breathing and not interrupt or add noise to what they're hearing. So that could be because of the differences in the way our metabolism is and the way we breathe might have to be one of the reasons or at least a benefit to not having that passage. And they noted that some potential support for this is the fact that birds are also continuous breathers, but they don't connect to the mouth. They connect ear to ear. So avoiding that mouth connection might have been part of the reason that mammal ears ended up isolated. Yeah. And then very quickly here at the end, we haven't actually mentioned the vestibular system as much as the the hearing part yeah, of the we've, ear. We've been talking a lot about the external sensing aspect here, yeah. the hearing part. The balance system is a very important part of the inner ear, but there's not quite as much big scale, you know, different groups coming up with it separately because it is pretty consistent across vertebrates. Like we we all have very similar semicircular canals going on. Some have fewer, like there are ones who have lost one that have very simple ones mm -hmm. and there is variety. We have found tons of research that shows a link between the shape of the semicircular canals and the way animals move with the size and radius and, and curvature of those canals decreasing or increasing based on the amount of movement that is typical and even the kinds of movement that an organism utilizes and therefore needs to be able to sense while they're moving. You know, some of these are simple, like faster moving organisms tend to have a larger radius than slower moving ones. But then we also do find some odd shaped ones with particular groups. So there has been research into that with some interesting findings, both in modern groups, but also suggestions of the behaviors of fossil groups. Yeah, it's that those correlations between the shape of the semicircular canals and how an organism moves or holds itself have allowed a bunch of paleontological studies to make inferences about this is how this animal may have moved around. Yes. Uh, there have been a number of studies that I think we may have talked, and we've talked about a bunch of this kind of stuff in the news. Mm -hmm. There have been a handful of studies that have used those in part to infer the position of the head mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of things like dinosaurs. Yep. Like, did this dinosaur hold its head pointed slightly downward or perfectly horizontal based on the shape of those inner ear structures? Yeah, because we need the canals are angled to the planes of movement, mm -hmm. you know, with one each one right angle from the other and each one pertaining to an X, Y, Z axis of our movement for our head. So if you're holding your head at a particular angle, they should match that angle to at least some degree. Yeah. And this can be important for other, I, I want to say that there's been a, some studies on this in T-Rex that have suggested holding the head at a particular angle that would also allow it to see better in front of it. Yep. Yep. Because you're getting the snout out of the way of the eyes. So how the animal holds its head can have implications for what it is doing with the various structures on the head. Absolutely. It also can be used for types of locomotion, especially when we're looking at a group that developed flight with dinosaurs that has been looked at. When do we see the bird-like inner ear develop mm -hmm. and what groups do we see it in and how much is that indicative potentially of flight or is a bird-like inner ear something that came around before flight did? Right. What Was it actually a running around and jumping a lot inner ear or a moving through the trees inner ear that Dan gave rise to a flying inner ear? Absolutely. And they have found in a, a couple of different studies that the bird-like inner ear showed up in non-flying ancestral bird lineage, uh, dinosaur lineages, and seems to be much more important for enhanced sensitivity than just flight, period. It also can be important for very particular ways of life, like subterranean mammals have found to have widened canals compared to a canal with similar shape, and that this could be due to the fact that underground you don't have sight, so body position is all the more important mm. while you're down there. So it's a more sensitive organ, potentially. Yes. Well, on the flip side, three-toed sloths have high levels of abnormality in their canals because they're not moving much. Listen, three toed slots have <laughs> high levels of abnormality just top to bottom. Across the board. <laughs> and it goes all the way into the inner ear where because they're not moving much, there's seemingly not as much selective pressure 
to keep it functioning at a high degree so it can get kind of wonky. Interesting. Yeah. We've also noted super small inner ears in whales, which could be to avoid getting dizzy while moving in a 3D environment. Hmm. That they're needing to reduce some of that input because they're moving in more directions than the average mammal. And so they are would be prone to overstimulation if they had a normal terrestrial ear. And then lastly, I found a study relating mammal inner ears to the development of endothermy, of warm-bloodedness, because the fluid inside the inner ear, the fluid inside those canals is called endolymph, and its viscosity, which means basically its thickness. Right, how runny yeah. is the fluid. How runny or kind of goopy. The viscosity increases, gets thicker with temperature, with mm -hmm. higher temperatures. So higher body temperature would actually thicken up the fluid inside the inner ear, making it less responsive to movement detection and equilibrium, which is an issue on its face. But also, if you're becoming more blooded, you also are typically becoming more active. Right. And you would so need... You're moving around more. ...better senses of your motion. <laughs> so the paper basically said they need they likely would have had to adjust that those canals for this development of higher body temperatures there's chemical ways you could do it to change the anatomy or the consistency of the fluid mm -hmm. so that it doesn't thicken up as much but there's also mechanical adaptations you, you can change make. the shape of the container mm -hmm. effectively so they looked for those mechanical uh, uh, traits and put together a database of semicircular ducts compared to body temperatures that they then could plug fossil groups into and based off of this determine whether or not they were likely over or below the warm blooded you know the endothermy threshold hmm. and detect where according to the inner ears it is suggested it showed up along and in different lineages of mammal and mammal ancestors yeah this fossil has the inner ear of an endothermic animal exactly that's cool and they found some interesting things. They said that, based off of this, suggests that endothermy evolved in the late Triassic among mammalomorphs, and found that they likely would have been similar in their endothermy to monotremes today, where they are maintaining temperature, but with periods of lower body temperature and not to the same degree as a lot of other mammal groups. So, likely between 31 to 34 degrees Celsius. So this is one way the inner ears have been used to track potentially one of the other major features of being a mammal, which is maintaining mm. our own body temperature. Yeah, it's one of the things that really stands out with the discussion of how do we track the evolution of mammal inner ears is that that process is tied so tightly to the evolution of a bunch of other things that are distinctly mammalian things. Yep. The evolution of the jaw, which is very particular in mammals, the evolution of our physiology, the way that mammals function metabolically and temperature-wise, which is also something very distinct to mammals, the evolution of social behavior potentially, lining up with what kind of sounds they're hearing, all of which can make it very difficult to answer the questions of what was driving this particular feature as it changed, because they were all changing at the same time. Yes. Over the course of the same lineages and ended up with a group of animals that are extremely specialized and distinct compared to everything else. Yep. Well, because like, you, and these are hypothetical situations. You know, we don't know the answer, but like if the metabolism increasing body heat affected the inner ear and increased our activity, changing the way we breathe could have separated our ears, leading to higher frequency hearing, leading like, each one can be extremely highly tied to the other. Mm -hmm. You know, many of these are still, you know, early findings and single studies, but there's a bunch going into making the mammal ear the way it e the way it is and how high functioning it is. And with that, we can wrap up our discussion of ears. This was a big topic because ears are so fascinating and, and very complex. And like I said, tons of aspects of them could be dived into much deeper. So if there's some aspect of hearing or ears or a particular group's ears or kind of ear that you would like to hear more about, please let us know. We take requests. We do. There is a request form on the website, and that request form is linked in the episode description. 
That's where we're funneling our requests these days. Yes. Uh, put them in the form, that and is, they will get added to the list. That is the most sure way to get your requests directly to us. But before we wrap up the episode, we have one last section, which is our patron question. Every episode, we like to answer one of the questions our patrons submit because at certain levels, if you are supporting us on Patreon, you can submit questions that we answer here on the podcast. And today's question is from... Today's question is from Evan, who has a question. This question is not directly related to ears. Nope. Uh, but this is Will's episode, and it is a question directly w- related to Will. I wonder who picked this question. Evan asks, Crocodilian behavior, that's the Will part, <laughs> Croc behavior seems to be mostly antisocial and territorial in nature, and yet they often dogpile atop each other in large groups. Why is this? Is it about conserving heat? Is it because there's safety in numbers? Or deep down inside, do they just really love to cuddle? <laughs> An excellent question. Yes, crocs are not particularly social animals. Right, same. Yeah, they are not known for grouping together in, in you know family groups or herds, so to speak. They are often what we call gregarious, mm-hmm. which is that they group together, but not because they want to be near one another, but they are they have a high tolerance for each other, basically. Right. They are fine being near each other, but this differs species to species. American alligators are extremely gregarious. They group together in huge numbers, mostly just because that's a good pond for alligators to be in. Right. It, it, it happens just this is the place to be an alligator. Yes. So they all end up being in the same place. Well, the best way that I think to think of it is like a grocery store. Like everyone in that grocery store are all grouped together. None of you went there because the other people are there. <laughs> you all went there for the same yeah, reason. For the same resources. It's the same thing we've talked about with snakes, mm-hmm. uh, especially in northern places where snakes are not social animals for the most part. But if you live in an area that it gets really cold in the winter and there's only a handful of shelters that will get you through the winter, that's where all the snakes are going to yeah. end up being. It's like a hotel with no more vacancies. <laughs> it's just you all ended up there because it was the place you needed to be. The fact that anyone else was there was coincidental. Differing species will have different amounts of that. Saltwater crocodiles are notoriously antisocial and territorial. Yeah, I'm fighting each other off. They will usually have a big male and that male's females in a territory, and all other crocs are not welcome. The grouping and dog piling you'll see on the shore is probably, typically, because that's the best place to get the sun. Yeah. This is an ideal spot. I also want to be here, and you're already here, but if I just get on top of you, then I'm basically in the spot, and I'm getting all the sun, and it's great, and that's why you'll see them shuffling, because the other one goes, no, yep. <laughs> I would like to be on top, because I want the sun. I, the alligators at the aquarium would do that constantly under the heat lamp, and push each other or climb over each other to get more of the heat lamp, so they didn't have to share it. So yeah, it's more that they are tolerant of each other than that they are grouping together. Right. In some circumstances, it is more beneficial for them to not fight each other off Mm -hmm. than it would be otherwise because they're competing for some sort of resource that is plentiful or that they don't have to fight over so it actually works out better for them to not just get into fights with every other croc they see yes exactly and they you know they still will they will absolutely get into fights especially Mm -hmm. when mating season comes around now there is a new resource to fight over which is not only mates, but also nesting areas. Mm-hmm. So you will see plenty of fighting. But yeah, crocodilians in general typically are just tolerant of one another. They don't want, they don't care whether there's another one there, <laughs> but they also don't care that there is another one yeah. there. And this is another one of those categories of animal behavior, you know, sociality. Yes. That we very often, it is very tempting to think of it as social or not. Yes. But there's a whole spectrum, as with anything, of animals that are social sometimes and solitary all the other times, or social kind of coincidentally, or at least grouping coincidentally, versus animals that actively will avoid being around any member of their own species most of the time. Yes. There's a whole bunch of different versions of that. It's gradients in many directions. You do have crocs, like gharials, that will have nurseries. Where mm-hmm. multiple females will drop their fe- their young off, and one female at a time will guard a horde of a hundred or more. Yes, and that is an unusual level of socialness for crocs, but it does happen. So yeah, you have 
differing situations. And you'll also see the interesting cases. I've, yeah, you see this on documentaries every now and then of crocs sharing food. Yeah. Like one of them caught a zebra and then a few other crocs come over to get bites off of that zebra. And you didn't hunt together. Mm-hmm. You And if we were able to ask that croc that caught the zebra, I'm sure they wouldn't be thrilled yeah. that other crocs are coming over to grab at it. But that's where the food is. So yes. you're going to end up there. And sure, if that other croc managed to get a leg, that's fine. I, I've got my piece and we don't have to fight over it. Well, and they also, there's a there's a practicality to it because crocs can't chew mm-hmm. and they don't have slicing teeth. So they have to tear food off. It's a lot easier to tear food off when it's being held down by another croc. Yes. And when you watch those quote unquote feeding frenzies, you can actually see that there is a turn taking process mm-hmm. that typically only a few crocs are pulling food off at a time. And the others wait their turn for it to stabilize again for them to take theirs. There's also a hierarchy thing going on. The big crocs eat first and then the little crocs filter in. But there is this sense of non-combativeness. I'm not holding the food to help you, but I need it to be held when I'm going to pull off. Yes. So we are all doing the same Wait. thing so that eventually we all get food. Yes. It, well, it's like... Uh, uh... Uh, this is a weird I, just <laughs> traffic in general, but yeah, yeah. for some reason going to a toll booth mm-hmm. is what's in my mind because I recently took a road trip. <laughs> uh, we all kind of have to pay attention to what everybody else is doing at this toll booth so that we can all get through here. Yep. We're not here to help each other out, but I'll let you go first because it's going to keep this thing moving. Yeah. So there's all sorts of different levels of what counts, what constitutes social behavior yes. and cooperative behavior. Uh, It's very interesting. Absolutely. Thanks, Evan, for asking that question. Thanks, as always, to all of our patrons. If you have a question that you would like to submit to us and you are of the level on Patreon that you get to do that, go to the submission form. And hey, if you're not at that level, uh, that's one of the, that's maybe a reason to go up to that level. Yeah. uh, And get all sorts of other Patreon benefits. Don't forget that we've got a giveaway coming up at the very start of next year where we're going to be giving away some cool stuff to some patrons. Yes, we do. We also have the Q&A form that is out now for you to be submitting different questions for us to answer on one specific episode. Yes, that's for everybody. (laughs) So the end of the year Q&A, anyone is allowed to answer questions. We're going to answer hundreds of them, maybe. That form is linked in the episode description. It patrons, you can answer <laughs> special questions that we will answer one at a time, usually in the episodes. We do a lot. We like to talk to our this is like uh, listeners. We like those, to engage. This is like those field guides. It's like if this go to page B. Yes, if, there's a there's a if this feature go to section C. There's a chart. Yes. A Are flow. you a patron? Yes. No. All right. Cool. <laughs> do you want your question answered in a giant list of piled up questions with a hundred other people? Great. That's the end of the year (laughs) Q&A form. Fantastic. Make sure to check out the blog where we will have tons of pictures and links to a lot of the things we talked about in this episode. So you can see a bunch of pictures of the insides of ears, most of them drawn. So a lot less (laughs) gross than that sounds. Uh, That's on our website. Also linked in the episode description. Thank you to the requesters who asked to hear about ears. This was a fun topic, a big bulky one, but tons of fun to learn about. So thank you for that. And... Thank you to our top tier patrons for supporting us, Sarah May, Daniel the Bug Lover, and Robert Mart. Thanks as always. Thank you again. And with that, we can start, we can we can wrap up this episode. We can end it out. I've heard enough. Yeah, I know. My ears are tired <laughs> from, from I'm, hearing myself. I'm sure that, yeah, uh, listen, we can all sympathize <laughs> and listen to this guy. <laughs> we release episodes... Every fortnight. Fortnightly. Uh, one fortnight from now, uh, there will be a whole other episode about a whole other thing. Uh, I already know what it is. I'm excited about it. It's yeah. going to be a good one. No, that'll be a very... We may have touched on some of it during this episode. Uh, that's a little, it's a little teaser for you. Yeah. Speaking of things that's not easy to category into a binary system. <laughs> <laughs> I don't got nothing else to say, so... Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. 
The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.